Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Grappler Union Podcast, Javier Palomo alongside Anthony Zito. Our guest today is Tom Grant. Tom is a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Enjoy. Eight to six minutes. That's what happens in that six minutes. You told me using any tactic that works, never to limit myself to one style. Mine. We're not here to take part, we're here to take over. In order to become more peaceful, in order for you to become better and, and strategize your life. There was like right. there was like one other signature on there, and I was like, do yeah. I do the I write the my worst name? Thing. Paul, Paul Moy points it out to me every time because you remember this episode, right? I'm like the fucking worst signature. <laughs> I'm bored. Number no. five, the worst signature. I, I like. That's sh- how we we're gonna start this motherfucker. We, we already started in it. the yeah, moment <laughs> of it. I was like, I had this like terrible moment of anxiety, being like, wait, do I sign or do I write my name? What the fuck do I do here? Like, there's no fucking else on the board. I'm the first one doing it. I don't know what to fucking do. Print. He printed. And I printed like, my name, and I fucking have hated. It ever since then, so now you also fu- drop more f bombs right now. In this instance, that's how fired up you I'm are. So it, it, it has yeah. bothered me for however fucking it's long okay. it's been. Well, Tom Grant, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. A hundred and twenty episodes, episodes later. Yeah. yeah, and I got and, I, and some fight companions. Yes. A couple of camp- yeah. those don't count. Those don't count. Those, they're right. not in the rotation. Not not in the rotation. But yeah. yeah. We've got some experience up on on the whole podcasting thing. You've got some up, some experience, hopefully, in how to sign sign mat. things, how to yeah. sign things, yeah. <laughs> and looking looking dapper too, oh, long yeah. hair. Oh yeah, thinned out. Well, look at you. You're yeah, like a it's, completely it's, different man. It, it is life's changed a little bit. In however, 120 episodes of Grappler Union. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've I had a kid. I've moved a few times. Like, yeah, it's Wait, beautiful. A, a kid is, aren't you supposed to fatten yourself up when you get a kid? I've, yeah, I've gone the other direction. And I've lost weight. Beautiful. Um, That's a solid plan. Yeah, yeah. and and in uh, part of it, I moved and changed gyms and mm-hmm. things like that. That was a whole thing. Uh, but I still have, I'm still on good terms with everybody. Just like. I'm not by any of the gyms of the rest of itches. So I, I re I started training with some friends of mine who are like literally five, six minutes away. Beautiful. So that whole thing, it's been a lot, a lot of, a lot of changes in life in jujitsu since then. Cool. <laughs> so as I say, I don't know where, where do we want to start? I, we, we, I, I think we're, we're just talking about cheese fries. Earlier. We were talking about cheese fries. Bro, and don't Come on. Sorry, <laughs> we're talking about portillos. We're talking about cheese fries. I haven't had any breakfast or lunch yet. Yeah. You guys are either. I, just I, evil. I, yeah, I I just did a I just did a protein shake after trading, and that was my lunch. That's definitely more breakfast than I've that had. Was, yeah. That was my lunch. And so. a, a nice Where's hot cup today? of tea. Uh, we uh, Javi and I are always at Deerfield on Sunday. Oh, okay, okay. pretty much. Yeah, we, oh, you guys are together. Okay. Yeah, we're doing the the Nogi Sambo program, mm. Sambo Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, That's, a, and that that is one blend. of the ways I still keep a foot. I keep a foot in my roots with the rest of itches. I'm always I'm always at Deerfield on Sunday. Mm. Um, train and Barry Phillips is always there. My victimizing uh, everyone. <laughs> with his with his sharp elbows his and sharp bones. sharp sharp knees. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was talking to one of my teammates and he was traveling somewhere and he mentioned to me he's like, Yeah, I went to this gym and they were, did like, you know, um like almost like well what they considered like true jujitsu where it was like everyone's got the true self jiu-jitsu. defense involved with jujitsu where oh, like you know, strikes and strikes, stuff like that. And they couldn't understand the gym that he came from and they didn't do any striking. There's no strikes at all. That's not real jujitsu. Right. What, like, what even is that? What is that? It's like, I'm like, uh, he's, he couldn't understand. The guy was being like, trying to like board him on this, this jujitsu that, you know, is the true jujitsu, the Helio Gracie way. The I, was gonna, Gracie I, I, way. I was actually going to ask, I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah. is this like Gracie jujitsu that they're yeah, it's t- Gracie or, jujitsu, you know, but some... you know, sh- throwing in, you know, the whole strikes and doing stuff like that. And he was like, he's like, it felt, he goes, I felt really weird. It's kind of like, I didn't never really experienced that before where I right. did, he was, I didn't even know that was a thing. I knew no gi and gi was always a thing, but I didn't know that striking and no striking jujitsu was a thing as well. Cause right. I know there was like a, the, a split between the two where like you got to be on our team and you can't just do sport jujitsu or I'm like I didn't know that either I always I, I mean there's the no definitely gi. some people that feel that there's a very distinct split between mm-hmm. like the I don't know what, what do we even call it anymore like ultra orthodoxy jujitsu yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know I mean <laughs> you know. so is it like you've been you know Maneko obviously it, do we just do sport jujitsu is that all we're doing I mean well, I don't okay, feel hold like on, it's hold just on. sport me, related there, there's there's the easy question sure. Um, and I don't know that this is like the defining point, but like, 
if most of the stuff that you're doing is about points mm -hmm. and you can honestly say you come from, quote, an IBJJF gym mm -hmm. and you never do any self-defense or striking what, what, or no, weapons define training. Define self-defense. Like if I can choke someone out, mm, I could take someone down and armbar them. That's pretty good I, self defense. If I'm in your garden, I can punch the shit out of you. That's not self defense. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, do we want I don't, to test this? We'll, we'll I don't turn know. Off the, if we you, turn off the mics right now, if you, I, if, I will <laughs> eagerly watch this. If someone got in my guard, I know. I know that I can break their posture. Okay. I know I can control their arms. I know that, but I don't have to know strikes to know to do that. That's just my jujitsu is break posture. If I mean, you're in my guard, I'm not going to let you extend your arms. Okay. You break and then my when guard. I lift you up and slam you in the ground, you know how to stop that? Yeah, I would let go of my guard and stand back okay, up. And now I'm going to take you down and start beating uh, you again? I don't know if you're going to take me down. Did you, you just say that on air? <laughs> <laughs> well, you we might take me down, but uh, average Joe probably would yeah, not be able to take Bruno, me down. Bruno, you may want to edit that one out. <laughs> yeah. um, save him some face there. <laughs> and I, I think ha Javi, yes. You, but well, no, I'm no, saying no. average Joe. I'm, I just feel that self-defense in a gen is a very general term. And what I feel, if I if I taught, if you had your average I, Joe I'm gonna, on the street. I, I know where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah, I, right. I, I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. But that's not that's that's just your ability to apply your sport technique correctly mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. a resisting opponent. Okay. That's not necessarily self-defense training. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll bet on any, any wrestler that's never thrown a fucking punch in his life, mm -hmm. probably gonna be able to handle himself in a fight. Right. You know, one-on-one -on -one against a, a relatively untrained dude, sure. you know, um, and actually that, that probably applies for a significant number of martial arts, even the ones that aren't that realistic if we're talking about untrained dudes. So then are we talking strictly when it comes to striking then? So only when you apply strikes in, with jujitsu is it now not sport jujitsu? I think the way to look at self-defense, at least in the sense of it, it is, it's like when people say like, well, are you doing mixed martial arts or jujitsu? Jujitsu is a component of it. Jujitsu right. is a component of, if you're really looking to do like, I want to focus purely on, can I stop someone from hurting in me in an uncontrolled environment, mm -hmm. you got to train essentially like you're doing mixed martial arts, also including weapons mm -hmm. and including so many other factors. Mm -hmm. And grappling is an aspect of it. And for the most part, I think a lot of jujitsu schools generally train in a way that make you fairly able to use your jujitsu in that context, unless you're going at someone who trains very specifically and knows jujitsu and knows how to stop grappling or incorporate their own grappling into it and they can fuck you up like you know anti-jujitsu as it were not not even anti-jujitsu just like you know if if two if two brazilian jujitsu black belts do an mma match and one of them has spent more time applying it in the context of mma and the other one has not Bet the one who, on that, the, the one who the one who has spent more time applying it in mma is going to probably beat the shit out of the other guy are there any other martial arts that are so separated like jujitsu has been come. I feel I'm oh, look, judo's I'm, like that. Is it judo yeah. like that as well? Yeah, but okay. but like <laughs> okay, so judo's definitely like that. Sambo isn't necessarily, but sambo's like divided up already weirdly anyhow, okay. because like there's sport sambo and then there's combat sambo. Mm -hmm. And those are both sports, but combat sambo is like sort of MMA. Yeah. Okay. Um and then there's Real combat sambo, which is what military guys do, which is like knives and guns and, and striking and all of it integrated. Mm. And that, sometimes they call that like special sambo or or military sambo or something like that. Um, but back in the day when, when people talk about combat sambo, that's what, that's what it used to mean. But then, it, like I said, it became a sport. So it, it, it's kind of weird like that. Does judo yeah. have strikes? So <laughs> judo has some striking. Some of it's pretty laughable. <sighs> Yeah, yeah. 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 Long sigh. I, um, back in the day, the guys that were serious about doing striking training, because you got to remember that the Shotokan karate and judo, like and Aikido too, all came up like right around the same era in Japan. Okay, so so you, you had judo coming up. Uh, Kano was was you know doing things at the Kodokan and, and making moves and converting jujitsu into judo. Um, Around the same time, uh, Morai Osheba was was taking Aiki Jiu Jitsu and converting it into Aikido, which is an entirely bizarre and weird conversation to have that I don't I don't feel like getting into right now. Okay, and um, um, oh Jesus, uh, Funakoshi uh, Gichin Funakoshi was bringing Okinawan Karate 
from Okinawa to mainland Japan. Mm. So judo early days has kind of not great striking, okay? Um, almost all of it focuses on like hitting vital areas and pressure points. It's called atemewaza. Um, early, early days judo, when it was still very close to traditional jiu-jitsu, um, has that, that element of like you would strike him here to set up your throw type stuff. But it wasn't actually practiced in randori. There was no – we didn't have MMA gear. There's no safe way, right, air quotes, right. to do it. So, um, so like a lot of that stuff fell to the wayside. But then because karate was becoming a big thing in Japan during this time period, um, a lot of the judo guys would cross-train with karate guys um, to learn some striking. Like, like Funakoshi actually came to, I think, the Kodokan, but it might have been, been one of the other institutions and like – Train judoka on how to strike, but yeah, if I, if I showed you the the striking kata of mm -hmm. judo, you'd be like, "What is this? Right. This looks ridiculous." Because it's not kickboxing; it's not mm -hmm. you know, it's not very dynamic stuff. So jujitsu is broken up into three groups. You have your nogi guys, you have your sport jujitsu guys, and then you have your well, I, I don't know that that's fair. I think uh, what, what else will there be, right? Because I, I think combat jujitsu is that what Heidi well, Bravo's uh, thing uh, is now. Man, I, I, going back, I is think combat uh, jujitsu totally different than what they're talking about. One of my first, one of my first uh, instructors, Adam Restovich, always said that he he mentally divided it up into specifically jujitsu for sport competition, MMA, and then self defense. Right, and, and that's that, kinda, those are the that's kind of my breakdown too. Yeah. He like, separated MMA and self defense. Well, I mean, MMA is a different thing. You right. you it is <laughs> MMA is a fantastic <laughs> fight simulation in a controlled environment. And I'm not going to be one of those people saying MMA is useless because it's a controlled environment, but it's a controlled environment. You know, okay. there's a referee, there's all this other stuff, right? There's only one opponent. There's only one opponent. And like all, no all those things. No and weapons. then like, yeah. if you're doing a self-defense training, like part of it is, is that like, you might not know the fight has started, <laughs> you know, like one of those things, like right. you may not, the, the opponent may not be in front of you when it starts, or, you know, you gotta, you have to be able to watch their hands. So, you know, if they're going in their pocket to get out a knife or things mm -hmm. like that. Right. Uh, and you know, if you work with, if, if you train with guys who are in law enforcement or in the military, you know, they, they talk about developing those kind of things. When you're grappling, you need to have an awareness of those things. And you're not necessarily going to get that if you're just focusing on the other two, mm -hmm. you may adapt to it very quickly. Like you, you, you may, I mean, is again, going back to that idea that if, if I have spent 10 years grappling and somebody who carries a knife, but doesn't actually know how to use it attacks me and we end up grappling for a knife, I feel pretty good about the fact I'm probably going to win that grappling match, even with the added factor of I have something I have to control. Mm -hmm. um, but if I get someone who's spent as much time working with a knife as I've done grappling and we end up in a grappling match for that knife, I feel less confident with that. Does anyone know the history of when Helio and Carlos Gracie started adopting this striking and well, utilizing that? How did that all work? I don't even you, know how that You're started. actually going bass backwards. Am I? Yeah, so okay. so everything started with what I, I guess today we would think of kind of as like self defense jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the whole basis of it. There's a lot of a lot of throws of maybe not you know judo caliber, but like judo based throws. Are we, and, going, are we going? Yeah, we're going way back. We're going this is before Helio. No, let's not. Let's not even try to like. Let's talk. The guys on your wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's talk Carlos and Helio. Okay. Yeah. Early days jujitsu is all with the intention of self defense and and being able to do valetudo type shit, which probably I don't even know if they called it valetudo back then. To be honest, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's the nineteen twenties. Sure, sure. Was, the, in in those early side years, thirties, sideshow fights 40s. at carnivals. Okay, like yeah. So so I just, sport so jujitsu did not exist. Mm -hmm. Did not exist right. until the nineties. No, no, no. I, I think. No, a little bit further back. I think the – oh, man, I'd have to look this up. I, me and Drysdale were just talking about this at a seminar too, and I can't remember the date he quoted. But I want to say – It would be nice if you brought him in here and he could explain a lot of stuff. Well, you know, I'll, I'll maybe next time. Movie. Maybe next time. Yeah. It's okay. I'll be your silver medal. It's okay. <laughs> 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 that is, was weeks ago, guys. Um, week ago. But uh, no, regardless, I want to say – the first draft of like the sport jujitsu rules were like 1965 ish. Hmm. And that's where things started to change. Now take, a, it, it takes a long time for, for like uh, an art to adapt itself away from its roots and become a sport okay. because that, that happened with judo too. Like mm -hmm. judo wasn't an Olympic sport mm -hmm. until the sixties. And that's when things started 
tearing away where it's like, oh, we're going to change the rules for the sport. And then people are like, well, this is the sport. So we're going to change what we do in the gym, even, you know, yeah. so, so elements but of my el question, my question was specifically, where do they learn? Where do they take their strikes from? Where do they take their kicks from? How, how do they adopt these striking stuff in jujitsu? Like, where do they get it from? I mean, they throwing hands. I mean, like, so I can, I only, you, I only, you, I only base this on Jeet Kune Do, right? So I, I have a background in Jeet Kune Do. Uh, so I, see, I had me, to drop that. So I, for I, me, I, I, I think like, like Bruce the, Lee, the, oh, we, Bruce well, we're going to learn from took boxing. This, and he took like box, that. he took footwork, he took, nah, he took nah, all nah, these things here. I mean, we're, when you created one Jiu Jitsu was in Helio and Carlos's hands and they were saying, we're creating Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Where do they take their, where do they learn their striking The first thing is that in, in, the availability of op even opportunities to train in other things were significantly less. Mm -hmm. I, think, well, I mean, they probably had access to boxers. If yeah, they you wanted probably had to. some access to boxers, yeah. but again, like, but, and then you're talking about like high level training, much less diffuse and much less available. Yeah, you, like you were learning a couple of basics, and then kind of, I mean, and to a to a certain degree, like most of the evidence points to that's also how we got the grappling in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is they got some of the basics and then just figured the rest out mm -hmm. for the most part through through training also a point of contention but yeah it is a point but, of contention but there there is evidence to suggest right. that they, their their amount of formal training was much less than we were than we've been told previously and that right. a lot of it and to a certain extent the end result's still the end result they we still ended up where we are now right. and that but like more of it was just them figuring it out on the mats than or, we were led to believe or even more importantly later generations figuring it out yeah mm. like that's a very important detail there so so here's the thing um Brazil, I don't want to say natively, but natively has capoeira. Um, you've got a huge population of ja Japanese expats, uh, which is why judo is such a big thing there, which is why jiu-jitsu probably thrived the way it did and, and changed and became what it did. Um, is there strikes in Japanese jiu-jitsu? Yes. Yeah. 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 Traditional jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. has striking elements. It has weapons elements. Okay. okay. Um, judo guys – Oftentimes, probably more so back in that day, mm -hmm. uh, were were ready for striking situations. Like it's in the katas that you have to know how to defend strikes and things like that. How well practiced that is, I couldn't venture a guess. But you know, like they're not necessarily early days. Gracie Jiu Jitsu strikes were probably not black belt karate world champion Muay Thai kickboxer level. I mean, we, we saw what Hoist was doing, you know, in the early UFC. This, this and it's is like, what I was getting yeah, to. It's, yeah, like, yeah. it's a stomp kick. Uh, Gracie in actions, they're, they're just open hand striking. They're just kind of like winging yeah. their hands out well, there. Right, I know they, they weren't supposed right. to close, but it didn't look very technical. It was yeah, kind of like just probably wave your hands around, get them to the ground, and right. then, you know, choke them out. Sure. Right. Yeah. Pretty much. That's probably yeah. So that's what now my point but, is like when when people say you're not learning the right jujitsu and I'm like okay, I mean like also let's, what, let's what just are you be guys clear. doing that the, we are, that we that they are not doing the, the moment event. you run into anybody who starts putting the real in front of the name of their <laughs> yeah. martial art yeah, is yeah, usually all the way back to that initial usually point. Somebody <laughs> that you need to just whatever they're saying is uh, you need to start grabbing a handful of salt yeah. <laughs> like just just exactly. not just a grain a whole shaker no a whole sh the whole shaker the whole whenever, whenever I was like oh man like I'm sorry that's not the real insert right. martial art here right. like yeah. that it, they're coming at it from a very particular point of view and yeah. i and i want to point out that like my, my whole yeah. reason for taking that deviation was just i want to make sure that the historic context is correct that we're like yeah we only have a two-hour podcast though yeah. for that well Sorry. right sure <laughs> yeah so yeah we're, we're coming from a situation where right and and thus why the real you know like yeah. maybe the better version for that would be the older yeah i don't know like like what is real even mm -hmm. but yeah so like it, it moves from like a self-defense form mm -hmm to a sport changes a bajillion times as the rules change as as things get adapted and whatnot and is its current form mm -hmm. i tend to break it down similar to how adam does where mm -hmm. it's like you know like sport technique in terms of and then obviously it divides up in terms of gi and no gi okay and then mma which is predominantly obviously a no gi focused my my default assumption obviously years ago this wasn't true my, my default assumption is if we're talking about MMA we're also talking about little gloves because mm -hmm. that changes a lot yeah. um, and then obviously you know street self defense whatever the fuck you want to call mm -hmm. it where it's like you know whether you're in plain clothes or wearing a gi or in no gi you know but 
the default assumption there, strikes are on. Um, weapons. weapons are possible. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on your training, you know, the possibility that we're having to, having to work awareness training, multiple man scenarios, yeah, crowd intervention, yeah, all, all kinds of stuff. things like that. So yeah, like it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. It, the, and obviously there's a lot of difference there's, there. Yeah. There's the, the main thing I always get concerned with is like, and, and I, I think I've said this several times, so I'm probably boring our listeners, but like the difference between me being able to do like no gi sports stuff at a pretty high level and then being able to go with a guy who's like, even a even just a, a fairly journeyman MMA guy, but we're wearing the gloves. We're not in. We're not in a gi. We're not even in rash guards. You know, we're like in board shorts. You yeah. know, and, and like wailing on each other. And you're once it hits the ground, the cage. Yeah, the cage yeah. changes yeah. things so much. So so it's like to me, like there's a lot of things that I know that I do that are very sports specific. You know, my guard is not always going to be set up to, to counter strikes. Mm-hmm. Guys that are good at that that particular game, like actually trained at it, not just like wildly flailing, mm-hmm. you know, good at that actual game. It changes my jujitsu like instantly. Yeah. It has to, or, or, or I'm just like, oh, this is miserable and I hate it. And mm-hmm. it is isn't also interesting. You're, you're pointing out like the, the Gracie and Action tapes where like they were striking on the ground and they were like, they didn't look very technical. Going back to the 90s, like... There were not that many martial arts that actually practiced hitting people when on the ground. There, are, there, there were like two. There were like two, and one yeah. of them being combat sambo. Which, <laughs> and then people figured that out when they started seeing, uh, specifically Fedor, when he was renowned for his ability to punch on the ground. That he right. would get you on the ground, and then he could throw with power. Punching to takedowns too. Yeah, like, and punch I, into I love takedowns. That so much. But like mm-hmm. this whole thing where then it, I. One of the evolu- one of the real big evolutions in MMA that happened in like the 2000s was people learning how to effectively punch on the ground. Uh, and it was something that, that if you go back to the 90s, MMA was definitely lacking. It, ground and, and pound wasn't a thing. And now yeah, it, it, was, is a, it is a, it is a, I mean, back before the 90s, it was possible to win that way. It was, but it wasn't, it wasn't scientific yet. Yeah. You know, yeah. For, compare, compare what you see in like, even from like, Early 90s or, or late 90s MMA, even like trained ground fighters to mid 2000s to now. Mm-hmm. And oh, like yeah. when, we did our, we, uh, when we did when Neil came over, when Neil came to Chicago and did his seminar, That's, uh, Neil Melanson. Yeah. And and he touched on it briefly. And it was one of those moments where like, man, I would take a whole seminar of just, just hand topic. fighting to set up strikes on the mat where he's talking about the different traps he'll set up to trap your hands in one spot. So he can drop three shots quick before you free your hands right. and things like that to set up power strikes and things like that, where it's like, there's a whole game associated with that oh, now yeah. that, you know, go back 20 years. Nobody's doing that. Right. right. Or somebody was doing it, but it wasn't very refined. Yet. Yeah. You know, like, like there's a data thing also. I mean, now, now we're, for it's, sure it's just there's so much data and we can break data down because we can it's at yeah. our fingertips essentially so now we're like we can sit there and look back through all this data and be like oh that's how they okay boom 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 and now they come up with this whole system of everything oh yeah, yeah. The, the internet also changes that also because you can get access to mm-hmm. video of people doing it and teaching it in situations where you would not have been able to get it and then also probably brings up a, a point of where people become instructors based off of videos and now they're doing seminars and their technique might not be as good because they're, you know, they're the, I don't know, what's the equivalent of like that Instagram page where it's all fake, like people doing bullshit, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I mean, the the, bullshit, there's an like awful lot of bullshit on Instagram. Instagram page oh, that's okay. popular. You know what's, what's the oh, fuck? Bullshito? Is that yeah. or, or McDojo or whatever? Yeah, McDojo, yeah, yeah, Bullshito, those have been around for yeah. a while. Where, where people are like showing, I don't know, Paul Paul sends me stuff. Yeah, like yeah. That. Like, it's, you know, so key, key blocking techniques and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. The, 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 there's definitely some goofy stuff. Some of it looks less There's some interesting stuff out there. There's some interesting stuff. But uh, so good and bad with it, yeah, for yeah. sure. But like that's the thing, like like you always got to retain the elements that keep what we're doing real. Like, yeah. if, if you're not sparring with it against live resisting opponents, I don't care what you call it, it's probably not going to be very practical. Like there's certain things you could practice, like like you know, like drawing your knife, drawing your gun. You know, you don't need a necessarily live resisting opponent for that. That's just something you can do in front of a mirror to get, to to build the muscle memory and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But then like the difference of knowing how to do that in front of a mirror versus knowing how to, you know, move correctly and, and and, like move down the field while taking shots and and things like that. These are wildly different skill sets, Mm -hmm. you know? And again, you've got to practice whatever it is, whatever the art is, you know, 
um, you got to practice it the correct way. Otherwise, it, it's going to inevitably descend into bullshit. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that's why I think that, you know, at least everyone should compete at least once or twice yeah. through their journey of jujitsu. I mean, if I, it's I think possible. I, I, it's good. It's a Competi different, different thing. Competition is good. Like, there, that's, it's, I've only competed a little bit in my career, but I've always, I've always been grateful I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, there's a different, it's a different level of resistance mm -hmm. when you go in there. But yeah. I don't feel like it's 100% necessary. Gym rolling is off, like, enough to weed out most of the bullshit. And competition is like, if you want to make sure that it's going to work on really trained people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Gym rolling doesn't get rid of all the bullshit. No, and no, gym no. rolling creates but its own bullshit. <laughs> see, so so here's the thing that I think. I, I think you get – I don't want to just throw a random percentage. You get a significant amount of what you need from rolling in the gym, especially, especially if you either um, – have like a real wide variety of body types and, yeah. and, and styles and whatnot mm -hmm. at your gym. Or if you go to like a lot of open mats where, where you're going to get a lot of different looks. Yeah. Okay. What, what competition adds above and beyond, like, you know, the fact the guy's actually probably trying to win just as bad as you are, wants to take your head off. You're probably not buddies going in mm -hmm. when you are, it really messes me up. <laughs> but you know, like the added element of the lights, the crowd, the yelling, like, you're prepared for it and everything, but I, I think that that takes it to a different psychological level. Yeah, there's a more there's a similar headspace to a element fight. to it that yeah. you can, if you're not, if you don't, if you've never competed in anything in your life, I feel like visiting another school and rolling can can simulate it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, because it's probably pretty nerve wracking. It's nerve wracking. You're not comfortable, and in right. some ways, it's almost a little bit harder because the other person's very comfortable. Right. Um, yeah. Well. Unless they're also visiting, I guess. Unless yeah. they're also visiting, but if you're if you're like visiting a school and you go against one of their regulars and they're they're extremely yes. comfortable, you're at a headspace disadvantage sometimes. But yeah, I feel like if we're talking about gym gym rolling and the benefits there, um, the gym should have ideally the gym has some people who compete. Right, like you and that that brings that brings that knowledge to the gym, and they can they can share it with the people who don't compete in that sense of like even tightening up submission holds to get that to get that extra bit, bit of pressure so that you can break from there because yeah you get gym taps here but when they right. don't when they don't gym tap you need to be able to break it off and the way you're doing it not going to work so let's take a real quick pause here so Mineco's mm -hmm. sort of a within the context that we've just found basically a, a sport gym right. predominantly mm -hmm. nothing against that at all mind you right. yeah. okay not everyone competes of course right where you're at right now, Alliance uh, Schaumburg. Alliance Schaumburg, uh, a definitely a competition team. Like the focus is on competition. Higher percentage of competitors at a gym than I've really seen. Where okay. probably when an IBJJF comes to town, more than half the school is signed up. Right, uh, like more of half of their association between Naperville and Schaumburg signs up, which is like a pretty insane participation rate. And uh, right, as opposed to like one or two guys. But also, you have several people in that in those gyms who do um, security jobs or law enforcement jobs mm -hmm. or things mm -hmm. like that, who also have a pretty real basis when people are coming to coming to work uh, coming to coming to the gym after having to take like a you know a week off to let like a light knife cut heal so it wouldn't rip open while they were rolling like i think i know the individual you're talking yeah, about yeah there, there's there's a grounding there that still stays there but like those same people are also like yeah at work i do this stuff when i'm here i, I play spider guard because right. that's what works here right and also let's be honest like a lot of what we're doing at the gym is personal development, stress relief, yeah. you know, getting them a good workout regardless. But yeah. So, and, and also like, yeah, when you get into that also, if we're going to the, the idea that like, well, uh, I think Ryan Hall said it forever ago on an interview after his, uh, fight at the pizza parlor where, um, <laughs> he was that. just like, yeah, like I, I, I do when I'm in competition, I do the thing that gives me the edge over the other highly trained guy that I'm better at, which is turning upside down and doing crazy stuff. He goes, Dude off his med attacks me at a pizza parlor. My double leg's good enough for that. Like right, I right. double legged that dude, mounted him because I didn't need to spin upside down against that guy because I can double leg him. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I I love when I hear people like hate on Keenan and they're like, "Bro, is that guy gonna have a lapel in the streets?" You know, it's like, dude, 
Keenan's like a world champion like, level competitor. You, he's he's you, gonna be fine. <laughs> you know, <Exactly. laughs> he can, he can roll with like regular like regular hobbyist black belts and and like probably not even murder use grips them. and yeah, murder sure, them. For sure. yeah, I yeah. mean, the other day we were training. We were doing no gi more at Maneko's now. Um, that, I love hearing that. I know it's pretty cool, but you know, I. I I always, you know, I'm, I pull guard in competition and I just pull guard, you know, when we start rolling, but I, I was, had to take, we were doing takedowns and I had to take people down and I was like, oh, I, I can take, I can actually do this. Like, oh, yeah. I, I didn't realize yeah. when Mineko was like, take him down. I'm like, All right, I, I gotta do it. So, and I'm like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not that I can't do. I just, don't really you prefer not to prefer yeah. not to. And, and I mean, to be fair, as much as I love takedowns, like mm -hmm. You, you got to do what's the strategically smart choice for mm -hmm. you yeah, yeah. based on the rule set you're competing in. Yep. Right. You know, maybe you don't want to pull guard in an MMA fight. Maybe you don't want to pull guard in a street fight. Right. You probably don't want to pull guard if there's a penalty associated with it, unless you're super confident. So like, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the, the points rounds in ADCC, you know, you better be damn confident you're going to get those points back. Otherwise that guy's just got to stall the victory. Exactly, yeah. Right. But you know, but within most jujitsu rule sets, it's a completely viable strategy. Yeah. Right? In fact, it's, it's been proven to work really, really well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Travis Stevens also was just in town. Also didn't manage to get him on the podcast. Leave me alone. I try. <laughs> okay. But like, like he talks all the time about, about how. Uh, except knock me down to bronze. Oh yeah, you, no, uh, not I'm, I'm off the podium, no. aren't I? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> to be clear, we didn't get him on the podcast when he was in town, which is not this weekend. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, he talks about it all the time. Now here's an Olympic silver medalist that pulls guard yeah. in the context of jujitsu. Right. You know, because because he wants to get it to the mat, get to work, and doesn't want to let the other guy pull guard. Mm -hmm. You know, rules dictate behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's and that's the thing. I like doing. I mean, I'm not a fan of you know takedowns and that whole stand up thing back and forth stand up stand up. i just want to get to the ground let's start yeah. doing you know the only, thing, the only thing that like there's a lot of options and you don't have to play them obviously but there's a lot of guard options that are going to take you to a single leg yeah and you want to have at least enough stand up that you can finish that single leg reliably and get your points for your sweep slash takedown whatever they well, call it, it at that point yeah mm -hmm. well, that's so, why uh, that's to my understanding why the sweep and the takedown are just Score the same. Score the same because at some point there's like what's the, like when you come up out of guard onto a single leg and the guy defends for about thirty seconds and you spend thirty seconds on the feet in a single leg and then you finish. Was it a sweep or was it a takedown? It doesn't matter because yeah. they're both two points. Does, yeah, so the ref just throws up two and doesn't have to make a distinction right. on that point because that would be. I don't. You know, uh, that's an interesting thing. I'm trying to still dig up like some historic documents on like older versions of IBJJF CBJJ rules. Um, I don't know that they were always scored that way, but I think they were. I've never I think heard. I, I've, I, in refs I've talked to, there are distincting, distinctions that put into the rule so that you can differentiate between a takedown and a sweep. Um, right. But you, like I said, you like, need like Mike Mike Sim on the podcast to talk about that. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't like, it's matter, just, but they do have the it's distinctions either, in it's there. It's two points either way. I think historically it's always been scored as two. Yeah. I don't think there was ever like a point where like takedown was three and sweep was two or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been two. So I actually kind of wonder like – like. Was that deliberate? Did they did they I mean, realize that back then, or was it just a, a lot, very nice, convenient a thing? A lot of a lot yeah. of coaches complaining. <laughs> <laughs> True. You're heading off a lot of coaches being like, "What? Right? That mm. wasn't a sweep. That was that takedown. Right? Yeah, yeah. So regardless whether whether that was just uh, good good forethought or whether the rules actually change mm -hmm. to account for that, it's probably good that they're scored the same that way, mm. especially for that situation. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, you always want to have at least enough wrestling to finish your sweeps. Yeah. I, and does that make sense? Or you, uh, you just made a weird look when you're, when you're playing Nogi, man, the, the distinction between the distinction between your, your wrestling and your sweep game is pretty minute. Yeah. Cause sweeps even, almost and no even game. guys that are, yeah, yeah. even guys that play a double guard pull game, like unless they get locked in the 50, 50 or Barambola wars, like somebody's going to try to come up first, which is hysterical when you see two super high level guys playing that fucking sit down, get up game. Yeah. Jesus Christ. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, like when you come up, if the other guy's coming up, your ability to dominate a single determines whether or not you're probably going to score on that come up, mm. right? You, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Zito's like, no, I pull guard and I stay yeah, there. Yeah, but uh, like, to a certain extent, you, you, <laughs> when you're sweeping somebody, it, particularly in nogi, when you when it's much harder to yeah, secure yeah. a wrist. Yes. Right. Um, to a certain extent, if you start a sweep and the guy 
the guy's response can be like, no, I'm not going down. Come up and wrestle right. me I, down. I, I'm and, at and at that point, you're, you, you need to be able to wrestle to come up. Right. And you don't even need to have like great entry wrestling entries because right, you're already in on your single leg. You just have to be good at finishing single legs. And you can have that distinction of like, my single leg entries are at a much lower level than my single leg finishes because I tend to funnel my way to single legs when I'm playing guard. So if I get to a single leg, I feel pretty confident about my ability to finish it. But when I'm starting on the feet, right. I have a harder time getting there yeah, than and, if and I'm on my than if I'm playing guard. That also depends on your game. Like mm-hmm. like that's way more of a, a feature issue, whatever you want to call it, of like an X guard, a single leg X, deep half. Like like those single leg. My three favorite guards. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> so yeah, like, like those all have real strong single leg funnels, whereas like butterfly less so. Yeah. So X yeah. guard. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. Wait, wait, wait. I, wait. Have you not? Uh, I've done X guard. No, you know, oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> of I was like, wait, what just happened? No, 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 no. Why is it when I'm on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. So w- we were just training this week. Um, Maneko was, we're going over um, four types of guards. Okay. And he says you should at least be proficient in two of them. Mm-hmm. You know? um, butterfly guard, mm-hmm. spider guard, lasso guard, and full guard. Okay. I just shook my head at that. That was weird. Head. Yeah. Why did you shake your head? I just... I, I, you don't believe in lasso? I, I believe they're different guards, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but I intimately link spider and lasso so so much that right. like, I, can, that, I, I see yeah. them as, like, yeah, too. as interoperable. When I, you I, say X guard, I'm like, oh shit. I would need some X I would need some also. I would need some time to like chew on that a little bit, but I feel like there's there's a conceptual link, like conceptually what guards accomplish mm-hmm. and that there are only so many types of guards. Cause I feel like butter, butterfly and X guard fit into the same conceptual category there of like, I'm under you. Able yeah. They're inside to position you. elevation yeah. guards. Yeah. 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 Inside position elevation. Whereas, uh, I pr- lasso and spider definitely feel like a similar, like variations on a similar category right. not, to me. Not, not the same by any means. Just like, so, so intimately tied together uh, that I never would, if I personally was, if teach I was, one without teaching the if other. I was still writing. You know what would, I mean? This would yeah. definitely be like, this would definitely oh, be. Oh, this, this is an would, article for me. This would be like, go down. I love the conceptual stuff and like just going down like, what are like, what do guards accomplish and what are the different categories of what guards right. do? And what about open guard? I mean, open well, guard. That's like, that's a very broad statement because like. But we to, call it that. Right. right. But we say well, that term. We do and we don't. Like, I almost mm-hmm. never say open guard unless I'm talking about categories of guard. Yeah. Because Daily all, Hiva, the, Spider, yeah, all the open guards fit into certain, Hiva, have their own all, names. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only one that's kind of weird, and, and like I've seen a variety of names for it, but like when most people back in the day would say open guard, they were talking about like foot on the hips, sleeve control, mm-hmm. like or foot on the hips, sleeve mm-hmm. collar. Okay. And now that's like a lot of people straight up call that sleeve collar mm-hmm. or uh, yeah. shell guard, I've yeah. heard, you know, like there are different terms for it. So like I don't. If somebody says open guard, I'll be like, yeah, which one? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, unless we're talking about a, a general conceptual framework of open guard. Open guard, which is like you try to cut through all the names and like what makes it, you know. Somebody somebody had a fantastic video yeah, series yeah. on Adam Restovich had a fantastic <laughs> video on that that did change my view on it because that was right. – I, I think that's also my, my love of like going conceptual level is probably from, from spending time with Adam, training with Adam where he would always – because like in theory – you have to adapt jujitsu to fit you. Right. And if you understand conceptually why things are working, it's much easier to adapt it. If I can, if I can, you know, break down the sweep into its essential elements, you're going to be able to create your own sweeps versus have to just do it the same way every time. And if it's a, if it's a sweep that fits Javier's body type better than my body type, and I just try to force and it doesn't work. Oh, well, right. you know, and versus like understanding that I'm off balancing, I'm taking away your post and then I'm adding momentum to force you to roll over. You know, and then and then it becomes the point where you get to and you kind of do this on your own as you continue to grapple where you're playing guard. You realize you're in a good position and you go to knock them over and they post a hand out and you go, OK, I got to take that hand away. And once I take that hand away, they're over. I'm, I've got them over. And essentially, it's just arming people with like what with like how to create those situations. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Adam does that very well. Adam is very, very good at teaching conceptually and getting you to think about think about your grappling in ways that like let you apply it a little bit more to fit your body type mm-hmm. than just a rote like this is an x guard sweep this is how you do it yeah 
Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So anyway, I was just when you brought up XCOM, I was brought, just it was yeah, like this just, doesn't fit into the like, four things. That's well, that and I'm just like, oh fuck, I forgot X. So you know, you start thinking like, oh okay, there, there's definitely you know synergy between them all yeah but you know x guard and butterfly guard definitely i'm gonna this, i'm kind of, gonna chew on this this is this is an interesting got an article brewing about. over here i haven't i have not written in like do it for yourself yeah i write no yeah. seriously at that point it, it, i do miss that aspect of it that i would make my jujitsu better because i would study these things right and then once i understood it well enough to write it i actually was able to usually start applying it in the gym at a decent enough level that i could do it in a couple rolls kind of build it into my game and then start working it. And that, that, that study aspect, I now have to find time to do on my own, which is a little bit harder to do. Right. Cause, Cause it's I don't harder have to justify. It's harder to justify. It's harder to find the direction where I'm like, I'm writing an article about guillotines. Mm -hmm. Like that gives me a very particular thing I want to look at. Right. Versus where I'm like, ah, I want to, I want to study, study, I want to tape on study something, but it's like, what do I study? What am I looking at? Who, who I look at someone's game and I'm like, all right, I understand the grips they're using, but I'm not seeing anything revolutionary here. i just try to steal whole pe whole segments of people's games break <laughs> yeah. it down study it and yeah. then oftentimes like like in studying it whether it's from tape study mm -hmm. or they have an instructional or i've taken a lesson with them whatever it may be oftentimes just studying it i find that i'm not going to play that game exactly but yeah. here's the element here's the component piece that i needed for my yeah, own and game usually you and i are studying approximately the same thing right well yeah you know yeah. we're because just from working together so just much. yeah because yeah. this man right here you know i wasn't on 120 episodes ago but this man right here it's his fault that i do gi jiu-jitsu yep yeah i got him to do his first <laughs> and uh so so if we're gonna jump to i just got my purple belt and I was, I was, I was all excited. I had the summer, so I'm a school teacher and, um, my training goes in waves with the school year. I'm actually just coming out of my big low swing. Uh, beginning of the school year is a very hard time to train. I have just cause there's so much shit going, so much school, stuff right? going on. Yeah. Also, I tend to, I tend to do, I cover people's after school duties when they're doing sports teams and the people I cover for happen to do fall Summer sports. Oh, oh, fall sports. Fall, right. So, so out of the gate, I'm staying at work later. And then on top of that, we have, um, I teach, I teach segments of every grade level in the school. So we have like the go to school nights and stuff like that. And I have to go to every grade levels version of that. Just real quick. Do teachers hate it as much as the parents do the, the mandatory parent teacher I mean, conference? Like, <laughs> I, I, oh, the conferences aren't for a little bit, but like, oh, okay. yeah, this is just the go to school where they like meet curriculum me and, and they realize and that just, I, I understand the importance of it. Cause it's like, they got to know they're sending their kid to me and right, like right. for a lot of the, you know, that's a, that's a big thing. Like, Oh no, he's a monster. And I'm helping for like, I'm helping form their opinions on the world and stuff like that and all that stuff. Like I'm not, I'm not the factor in their life, but I am a influencer in their kid's mm -hmm. life. They want to meet me and make sure that I'm not a fucking creep or weirdo or can like do that in a I half mean, hour conversation not always though? but like if i can present myself professionally I mean, listen, and i can listen if if i go to so you're like saying that no teacher has been fooled by anybody no oh, teacher no it totally it's, it's, it happens all the fucking time <laughs> it, it, on the fucking news all the time it, it one of the things like how many like just think about like how many schools there are just in this area mm -hmm. like there are schools all over the country there's some there's some there's some bad people doing this for that, sure and, but like they want to have met you at the very least so that when so that they can pick you out of a lineup if need be yeah yeah and so <laughs> pretty later, much and for us it's a it's the first chance for us, us to establish the relationship right. and things like that because we're going to be working with these people like that right. we were like very much work with the parents especially if the kids going through challenges and things like that I'm in contact with the parents because like I'm helping that kid there. I'm helping that kid develop, but they're the prime, like the parents are the primary influence on this kid. 100%. So anything I do, I want to make sure that it's in line with what they want and how they're doing right. things so that it works it, the same way with coaching too. Yeah, like exactly. Like, what do you think about the the schools and uh -oh. the curriculum? Oh, going, boy. going down a wild rabbit oh, hole here. Right. I'm just, I'm just. I mean, uh, he's a I teacher. Work, I work in a fantastic school district. Uh, I'm, he's not just saying that. I know. I work in a really fantastic school district. Uh, I'm given a lot of intellectual freedom to pursue things the way I want to do it, yeah. um, and I work with really outstanding staff. Like the staff at our our building is are really really good at their craft. Um, lots of them have done other things in life or are doing it. We have, we have at least two teachers who are at our school who both in addition to being full-time instructors at the school are also 
multiple book published authors and things like that who are like writing professionally on the side and things like that. So it's a building full of fantastic talent. Um, there's a lot of challenges in the profession that I am not particularly dealing with. I dealt with it, uh, especially when I was student teaching, I was, I was down in the city and I've seen that side of things. It can, it's a very challenging problem that we don't have time to go into. Um, and it's, it's multi-layered. It's, mm -hmm. it's, some of it is structural. Some of it is the way we structure education. Some of it is the way that parents interact with teachers. Some of it is cultural. Some of it is like, it's, it, it's, it's a very complicated problem that we're, we're going to have to, yeah, that is going to require solutions, but, uh, more than we would get into here. So <laughs> We're all Great. on the same page. How the hell did we get here? What were we That was my fault, about? actually. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the blame for that one oh, initially. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I'm, I'm coming out of my low period where, like, I'm training, like, two times a week. Um, and just because of all the stuff going on. Because uh, without wow. fail, those go-to-school nights and everything are always on my jujitsu nights. Always. They, <laughs> they never met. I don't know who they coordinate the scheduling with, but it's always conflicts with my scheduling. Um, so, my my training kind of ebbs and flows over the summer. I'm able to train a lot more and usually I'll, I'll look for some focus or something to do over a summer to like add to it, especially if I'm like, I'm, I'm still working over the summer. I do other things, but I usually have a little bit more free time. And so when I got my purple belt, I was like, you know what? I I'm terrible at two things, takedowns and leg locks. I'm terrible at more than two things, but I have like almost no knowledge in live takedowns. You're less terrible now. And, and uh, thank you. Uh, and I've, I've done a few leg locks, but I know that I could go deeper on it. And I was like, well, and I had been learning about, and uh, I've been learning about Sambo through articles I've been writing on it. I think I'd already, I'd already conversed a couple times with, um, with Steve, um, Steve Kep for New York Sambo, yeah. uh, New York Combat Sambo, and I was looking for a Sambo school, and I found a Sambo school in in the western suburbs, uh, and it just so happened to be the one Javier taught at. And, at the time, yes. And I went with him, and and there were some there were some good there were some good people there, and some good we did some we did some um, drill throws. There's obviously some uh, some skill happening on the feet there. I'm trying to remember. There was a guy there who's a brown belt in judo who I loved sparring with, and he planted me through the floor a couple times. But it was a great mat because it was a, a sprung floor. It was a sprung floor, so you could just get you could just get tossed and just pop back up. Yeah, no, uh, Kenny neat. Kenny's martial art Elk Grove Village. Yep. one of the one of the the best sprung clouds floor. to land oh, on. Oh, it was so yeah. good. It's still open? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. The, so just to clarify. The, they teach a variety of martial arts there. They teach uh, it, the main focus of the school is Tung Sudo. Okay. And uh, uh, Tung Sudo, they teach Taekwondo, uh, Kung Fu, they teach stick fighting. Um, so, like, like a very wide focus. The core of their grappling program, however, is Sambo. Yeah. Nice. And um, when they decided that they were going to go from like a mostly striking based school to also including grappling, they did everything right. Like they, they set up a beautiful floor. That's just awesome to take falls on. Yeah. You know, good, wow. good matted area. Is it yeah. elevated? Yeah. 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 It's so, so it's elevated. Um, it, it's, uh, foam blocks. Okay. So you step up, I don't know how, how, how tall it is overall, but, it's a but couple you have to inches step up it's in, off the, uh, the ground level to get yeah. onto the mat. And then, you know, like we have a crash pad there, but like you got to be doing some ridiculously hard throws to actually need it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. You, you got to be. So what's underneath the, the. So, sorry, sorry. So the, the basic structure is you've got the, the top layer is the mats, of course, then they use like wrestling style mats. Okay. The next layer is like, um, you know, your wood base layer that the mats sit on. Mm -hmm. And then it's foam blocks are attached to that wood base layer. Okay, and some people use like tire yeah. or or like not actual springs typically, no. despite the fact we call it a sprung floor. And then you know that that sits on the concrete, mm -hmm. so um, so it has your, extra give. Yeah, when you, you go you're down, elevated you're, up, yeah. and then when you when you impact on it, you know the the, the foam helps absorb sure. that a lot. You you feel so it nice. feels like. Um, it feels almost like a ring, like when you're in a, a boxing ring and there's a little bit of spring to it. And it's got that sound to it yeah, as well. Yeah, it's, it's also like a, a lot of like, uh, obviously, gymnastics uh, platforms and stuff like right. that. But, but yeah, yeah, like if, if you're going to if you're gonna learn takedowns, mm -hmm. you're, that's a much I don't know. I, I more think comfortable it, I think situation. In general, every gym should have an elevated uh, some type of gym. Ideally, ideally, I would agree with that. It's just yeah. it's a lot of work. 
it's is a lot it, of is it a lot of work? Yeah. Well, it, depending on your mat space, it can right. be a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's very nice to have a sprung floor area mm -hmm. to work on. Most of the gyms I've trained at have not. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of judo gyms in the area that, mm -hmm. that have sprung their floors, uh, but it's pretty rare outside of judo sambo in my experience. Yeah, uh, almost everyone just puts the puts the the mat right down on the concrete or it's, hardwood. It's, a, it's hard, man. I tell you. I mean, I always I've been saying this for this is a long time. I just when I go to other gyms that don't have elevate, I fucking feel more beat up. Yeah, no, I'm it, just on it, concrete with fucking mats. It helps. Fuck. Man. It helps man. a lot. Beat the fuck out of concrete me. on you know puzzle mats or or just a, a single wrestling mat direct on concrete. Right. Yeah, it, it's That's a world of difference <laughs> feeling wise yeah. than you know like thick tatami or an elevated floor. It, yeah, it really is different. But yeah, I just so, feel if you're opening a gym, put it in the fucking budget. Yeah, just fucking elevated. You know, it, depends, it, it depends on your mat space too. Yeah. Like, a lot maybe, of the thing. Maybe like I know I know my current gym at Schaumburg, they got a huge mat space and it's awesome. But like that would be a lot to. That'd be to a have lot to elevate to try to elevate all of that. Yeah. That would be a that would be a lot. It'd be a project. Yeah, it I, would be. Yeah. Anyway, so but, but you're, you know I, you know I'm a believer. If you're doing something, you're creating a business. You know, let's go and do it. Do it right. I mean, what what's the cost? Wood and some labor, essentially. It's well. To be fair, it, it also needs to be maintained. Yeah. You know, occasionally you're going to have to rip that stuff up and and possibly replace. Yeah, stuff. we've done that in Monaco. So, yeah, so I'm just yeah. saying. Like, I know like, what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, Long term. But yeah, of course. Like, yeah, anything, yeah. you got to wash the match. You got to wash your walls. You got to repaint your walls. You got to do it. Stuff's yeah. got to be maintained. It's yeah. throughout life. It's the way it is. Like you said, I, I guarantee you, most people that are, that are doing jujitsu and are listening to this right now have probably not even experienced it. I mean, like they just don't know. Yeah. Right. And it's, it, it, is, it is a fantastic way to train. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it. And uh, going there, um, like I said, there's some, there some, there some really good people there. I got thrown through the floor more than once by people. Uh, but generally speaking, on the mat, when we did ground drills, I was, I was totally fine. I was purple belt. A lot of them were – some of the more experienced coaches uh, – some of the more experienced coaches had some game on the ground. But like some of the other students like had, had – very novice little, students. Yeah, there was very little experience on the ground, and then there was this like little little hobbit dude who was just leg locking me five times in a three minute <laughs> round, and I was like, and then and then he would teach, and it would just be like I, he would show me stuff that like I have been taught for years, and I was like I know this better in this five minute training session than I've ever known this technique. Like I gotta train with this guy more. Uh, and I think Javi and I became Facebook friends because that's Javi's move always. Yeah, as yeah, soon yeah. as you meet someone, yeah. If if I haven't invited, like if I know you and I haven't invited you to be friends with me on Facebook, most likely I thought we were already friends on Facebook. It's or not he that he doesn't like you. Or, or, I, or I straight you. up hate you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and then so I did my summer there, and and uh, there a whole variety of things in my game changed from cross training sambo. It's yes. one of the best things I've done. Uh, and then. Over that winter, we had like I think I forget what it was. It was like either a really bad snowstorm or a really really cold day, sort of yeah. thing. And it was one of those things where like every gym like shut down. Like everybody was like, "Nope, we're not training tonight. Like just stay home." And I was still like, I think I was still in my twenties and like didn't have a kid yet. And I'm like, "Screw that! I want to train." <laughs> and like put out the word uh, via Facebook that like, "Hey, people who want to train tonight, like I'll unlock the gym. Like let's go for it." And I like threw Javier like an invite, just being like, "Ah, like I know this guy like to train, and I I want to train with him again." So, and he got back to me. He's like, "Gee or no gee?" I'm like, "Gee." And you know, just bring bring gee. And did not own a jujitsu gi at the time. Yeah, he showed up in a he showed up <laughs> in a judo gi and yeah, okay. uh, wore a white belt. And uh, you wore a white belt. Yeah, you know, I mean, I. Um, well, this I, is before I, you were even. I. Okay, so you were a bl brand new blue belt. I, 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 I believe Planet. I was. Yeah, I believe I was a fresh blue at Tenth Planet, <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't officially have any ranking gi jujitsu, yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. We have we have uh, seminar pictures of you. Yeah, me with in Clark your, I in think, your judo right? gi and your white belt. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> that's because uh, yeah, I think that was the thing that happened. Is like after that, I was like, oh man, we have a Clark Gracie seminar coming so up. You should come when, out to that. When did you when did you get a blue belt in, in gi jiu jitsu? That was like uh, twenty twelve is when I got my blue belt in no gi. 
So when did you get and, in the gi? Well, I, I never had a blue belt in gi officially. You've never been I think belted I, blue in gi? No, no. I, what the fuck? I got jumped up straight to purple. Yeah. What the fuck? I, I thought think, this was I known. Think you got the, I think crazy. you got, if I remember correctly, uh, you from white to you, purple. you came to our school a few times and Barry gave you the green light to wear your, yeah, yeah, your I, blue belt I, because I, he's I, like, yeah, you're not a white belt. Well, it... <laughs> And, and the worst thing about it, I only wore that blue belt in my gi a couple of times, yeah. really, because uh, I got I, I went from from white to blue pretty quickly and then blue to purple mm-hmm. wasn't that long either. Uh, so I wasn't training gi that often, but uh, we had a, we had a session. So the first time Clark was ever in. I wore my white belt, and the next time Clark was there, you were in a purple at, belt. No, no, it, but Adam <laughs> was there with him. Yeah, if I'm remembering this correctly, and I believe I had my blue belt on. And since I didn't ever wear it, like it wasn't something I wore daily, it's like the freshest, the um, freshest looking blue belt ever. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, that was deceptive for for poor Adam. Yeah, because yeah. I, I remember also like you went, you rolled with Clark with your white belt on, mm-hmm. and like I just remember like it started out really slow, and you see Clark's face like kind of looking at you like. What the hell? Yeah, and then like it slowly ramped up intensity. My, my experience with Adam was the same. Like, like where he's like, "Come, come in the, come in my guard, you, you fresh blue belt." <laughs> right. And he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna pass." And he's like, "What the hell?" <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, so you came out to that like old man. I still remember there were there. Were, uh, we had a couple of you there. This this um big tall guy named Andrew who I haven't seen in in forever. He was like a college basketball player. Okay. And he was the one person that could give uh big John like a pretty, pretty, pretty solid fair role on the feet. Because that, that's, uh, they, that's purple belt masters world champion. champion. John Rogish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, this year. Who, yeah. And who, uh, who was a, um, I forget which division it was division two or division three offensive lineman in uh football in somewhere in michigan and has just these ridiculously long arms for his frame Mm -hmm. and on the feet if he gets a cower grip you're just you will not get anywhere near him it is as as many of his opponents found out on (laughs) at the masters worlds if he gets a cower grip it's very difficult to do some work right um and the two of that he was the andrew was the only person longer than john (laughs) so if he got a cower grip he could keep john on the outside um but yeah, and I remember distinctly being like, okay, like this guy knows, this guy's really good at foot locks. Stay away from the foot and you crucifix me. And that was my introduction <laughs> to your crucifix. Um, Not much has changed. Uh, and no. I think I think the primary thing that's changed is I think I actually comorage you that night. And I don't know the last time I've done that. <laughs> Talk about it. It, it, you're, it happens. Your comor is good. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm quite large compared to you, but like it does not happen with a great frequency. It it. It, it, the the level to which I remember rolling with you back then, where it was like there were aspects of your game that were super dangerous, but then there were other parts that were more they were, jujitsu they were specific. Garbage. You can see, you can say it was I, garbage I could, at the time. I could I could stick you into situations where your game was a little less developed, yeah. and now it's it's just all a tar pit. It's just all <laughs> bad idea. You just sink deeper in the more you. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, I spent an awful lot of time talking about me, but like. That's actually one of the really important things, and that's kind of why I brought it up. It, it's totally Tom's fault, but I'm actually eternally grateful too because, like, my background, I had done catch wrestling for years. I had a judo background. I, I told all my students when, I, when we started doing sambo that, I, like, I had relatively little official formal sambo training at that point. And, you know, like, I was, trying to, I was trying to become more trained in the specific elements of the art, mm-hmm. but I was I – was, appearing super competent at it because you know at the time i was what a judo brown belt and, and, your, and i had your particular style of judo was similar to was, sambo. yeah yeah exactly i i still had leg touches and things like yeah. that at, at the school that i trained at so like for me like learning sambo was just like let me integrate the the separate elements of my game leg locks and yeah. and gi throws and just put them together and, and sambo was a real natural fit and for the longest time, I was like, well, I hold my own against these gi jiu-jitsu guys when they come to the judo club or when they, you know, w- w- when I um, have them occasionally at the sambo club or whatnot. And then most of my other experiences at the time were like no gi context, mind you. Yeah. Um, so like, and it probably sounds super arrogant, but I'm like, I know enough gi to handle myself and to like know where I'm in danger that I s- – I don't really think I needed to study it as a separate thing. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like my no gi jujitsu combined with my judo was totally adequate for, for my needs. Um, and then I can't remember. I think it was you actually somebody while I was, while I was at Deerfield did something. And I'm like, what is this nonsense with this 
pocket grip on my pants. Yeah. Like, what, the, <laughs> what is this? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was like such a little thing, but it's like, nobody's going to do that to me in judo. You're, you're not going to grab the pants that way uh, on the ground. Mm-hmm. You, you simply wouldn't. And we don't wear pants. You know, we wear shorts in Sambo. We, we, we wear, you know, rash guard and, yeah. and spats or board shorts. And I'm like, I don't know how to address pants grips. And that was actually like the one of the moments that sucked me into it. Mm. I'm like, I need to know this because pants grips. Yeah. Teach me. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and thus began, because then you got me going to uh, like more Nogi stuff and mm-hmm. doing more. Uh, it's, it's been a fair trade. Yeah, right? I was going to say, because I believe I was at the first ever leg lock club. Yes. Yeah. The, yes. the first ever leg lock club. The inaugural. Yeah. Where the, was that? At 10th Planet Chicago. Wasn't I there? You were. Yeah. 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 It was at the, it was at the old, old location at the back of that. Not the old, old, the old, old, old. Yeah. The back of the power, <laughs> the back of the power lifting gym when yeah. you're like, oh, I got to cover Saturday class. It'll be fun. I'm going to go over some heel hook stuff. Like come out. <laughs> uh, yep. But and yeah, it became a thing. I was going to say, and, and at the very, uh, like, uh, I, it is, it is also helpful. Like coming to, coming to jujitsu with a grappling background definitely is a nice thing. Um, Cause there are those parallels. You can make those, you can make those connections and things like that. Where it's like for you, you just, it was like filling in aspects of your game. Cause I do remember right. like mo- one of my lessons also from rolling with you in the early days is like, man, like I can roll with a, like you rolling with a judo guy. If he even has almost no ground experience, which you had more than you had much more, but like after the takedown in that transitionary period and some of the other guys at, at Kennedy's kind of also drove this home, like, they are for that first like 20 seconds after the takedown, they are like black belt level compared to me. Like right. that I'm in, I'm in severe danger in that first 20 seconds before it becomes more like a jujitsu match before it settles before it settles. Yeah. And there's that, like that was one of the things that I really learned at Kennedy was there was that it in between the takedown and the ground grappling, it needs to settle. And when it's settling, you really don't simulate that moment when you're starting on the mat on your knees Right. Like you can't, it's hard to simulate that moment. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah. that's a, that's a moment of where a lot of offense can happen. Yeah. It, like the transition game is so important mm-hmm. and like we, we see it a lot. Like a lot of guys talk about it in MMA. I, I feel like it, it's not always well understood in jujitsu context. Um, and a lot of that, I think, just has to do with like, does your school focus on takedowns or not? Like, yeah. like if you do, then you then you know how to like go right to your your game winning. Well, I think once you, once you point right it out, jujitsu guys understand it, like understand that it's a thing really oh, right, quickly because right, right. transitions are everywhere. Like, but, we, but like we play so many transitions, they say, yeah, but the standing to feet is a transition in itself. And if you've just done something, that it, that's. That's how I get a lot of people to start doing takedowns with me, to be honest, as I is draw them into that. I draw them in on that yeah. idea that like, how did you like, well, I'll be working a sweep. They stand up. I hit one of the takedowns. I like, like right into a foot lock. And they're like, that was cool. And I'm like, well, like I learned it doing this. And then right. I can usually, I can usually rope that person into doing stand up rounds. With and me. also foot locks and also foot locks. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. the, that's the candy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and to a certain extent, I also miss the days when like the shin on shin to ankle lock was like my secret sauce that like nobody, that nobody knew that nobody knew. <laughs> and I could like, I could, if I was like, I was a purple belt and like 2013 Tom Grant talking I, here. Oh man. Like I, I do miss that. Like when I was a purple belt, if I was going with another purple belt, I knew that I could probably hit a shin on shin to ankle lock once and then just get murdered for the rest of the round. <laughs> but be like, oh, but my one thing worked. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's funny how the game evolves and changes. You yeah, know, like like the only thing I feel bad about is every time we talk about new school, like the only damn move that immediately comes to mind is like Barambolos. Like I'm always like using that, and and like Barambolos have been a thing for like seven or eight years now. Well, and I think to a certain extent too, it's just like we were talking about this at the gym before we came here slightly, but like I didn't get a chance to go into it. But like we were talking about like the 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 view of Z guard in Nogi. And oh how, yeah, that was how like. There was there was the time when like you people use it all the time and then mm-hmm. the leg lock game became more prevalent. People were like never do it. It's a terrible right, this idea. Is super you dangerous just, now. And then it became like oh wait like people figured out how to use it like start using it and now we're swinging back towards like people are turning away from it. And I think more than anything that just that just to me is like just keep your mind open, keep a fluid keep right. keep a fluid view of everything. Like the game is constantly changing. Things that people never did will come back. Um, 
Like I, I'm, I'm still a practitioner of deep half guard and not a lot of people do it anymore, but Jeff Glover still does it. There's people that still do it. And it, it, that is also, I've seen that come and go where it was like, right. the, it was the hot thing in 2009. Right. And then it, nobody did it. Right. And then some people did it again and it, everything comes and goes. Yeah. Everything old is new again. Yeah. You know, that, that's, or yeah, that's the, that's the way that saying goes, yeah, right? There's, <laughs> there's usually a couple variations on it when, when it comes back. That's, that's one of the things, like, I think we brought this up in the live, last podcast, too, but, like, like Bruce Lee has that famous saying, uh, 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 absorb what is useful, reject mm-hmm. what is useless. And I, I was, like, um, for me, I'm, like, and this can be a detriment, too. Like, like you don't want to just be, like, a, a technique collector where it's, like, I have an encyclopedia of 4,000 techniques and I'm not good at any of them. Yeah. Right. You know? But, like, there's a lot of things where it's, like, uh, this doesn't really work. I'm going to I'm gonna put it over here on this shelf for reexamination yeah. later. Yeah. Um, 50 50 was like that there, there, where like we, we saw that recent you know like people got away from 50 50 they're like no it's not good it's not effective you know there's better options and then people are like wait well actually i, <laughs> I think there's there is like you need to have the ability to assess if something is fundamentally flawed or if there's room to develop it right right and right. uh and the things i like when you're i feel like once you get to a certain point, you can make that assessment. Also, when you're like rolling at a higher level, it's very easy to assess like, oh, that just does, that's a bad idea. Right. Um, but I feel like it's, it, my, would be like when you're a white belt, when you figure out stuff that beats other white belts, but then does not work at the next level. Right. And you need to just, um, and you that gotta was, fi- you got to figure out if that's total trash or. One thing I was thankful for that I, I had a previous athletic background coming into jujitsu. So when, even when I was a white belt, I had that like I had that mindset of I'm constantly looking at what I'm doing and is is this something that needs to be tweaked or completely thrown out? Mm-hmm. And my base example of that is like the first time I ever really started rolling and you know it was like you get mounted a lot when you're starting out but we would do like mount sparring and I was like playing off people's reactions and I was like all right I'm going to like anticipate the arm bar and get out of the arm bar and I escape mount without like with minimum amount of work. Good old sacrificial arm. Yeah, yeah. and then it got to the point where I like I started feeling good enough about this. I started offering my arm, and it worked on white belts. It even worked on some blue belts. But I was like, I want to try. Is what I'm doing realistic, or is it just the fact that I'm doing it to other beginners? I went with Adam. Uh, Adam triangled me instantly off of it, and I was just like, (laughs) I'm I'm like a white belt with like two months under my belt. I just was me like, all right, let's just throw that out, and let's just do the things that I've been taught because. Those are the things that I see working when Adam and other people are rolling together, how people get out of Adam's mount. Like if it right. works with him, then I know it works. Right. For like sure. I want to do the stuff that w- will work when I'm a black belt, not the stuff that's only going to beat white belts and then have to like throw out my whole game and reassess when I'm a blue belt. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. The, the only time I do that, because I would, I would catch myself doing similar, not necessarily identical stuff, but like sometimes I would be like, I have no solution for this and this worked once. Let's see if it'll work again. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there's certain aspects of my game that started that way. And, and, you know, like I've kept it and developed it and made it a thing, but there's a lot of shit where I was like, Oh, that was a bad idea. Let's never do that again. Let's find the right answer. And you can, and you know, there are people who've developed whole games, like where they do something that's a little in the traditional wisdom, wisdom, suboptimal, and then they make it work. Like, like like turtle guard. I was about like, I knew you were. Turtle guard guard is like, (laughs) exact same thing. And and I'm, I love Telus so much. And I I fall like, I tend to turtle to prevent guard passes and to try to like, and, and I'm now reaching a point where like I've got some weapons from there that have been working for me to greater or lesser extents against very good people. What's, um, what's been working for you? Uh, specifically, the most recent example I have that sadly did not net me the win, but I, I hit the entry because it was um, in my most recent IBJJF uh, going against uh, Mike Roberts from 360 in Wisconsin. Really, really good guy. Really good grappler. Uh, he was up on me um, four to two. He had just swept me and I had stopped his pass. I had turtled. And it was one of those situations where there's less than a minute left. I can see the clock. I know I got to make something happen. And I go to one of my favorite techniques that is a combination of something I've always played around with and something Javi showed me, um, which is a knee bar attack while someone's trying to take my back from turtle. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but not, a, not a rolling knee bar. Not though, a rolling right? knee not bar. A rolling. No, it's no, no, they put a hook It's a variation. In. So yeah. it was one of those oh, situations okay. where it was like, and again, previous athletic background coming back into play where I'm like, all right, like 
this is where you this risk something. Go time. Yeah, it's it's a. I You're ha- already losing. I'm already losing. If I do nothing, I lose. Mm-hmm. I have, and if I do something conservative, I'm also probably going to lose. I have to take a risk here to make something big happen. So the near side hook comes in because that's the proper thing to do. And I hop as we drop. I hop my hips up, and I attack the other leg as he's going to put the hip as he's coming up to put the hook the in. Hook I stuff the hook, hop my hips around, and I'm right into a fully extended knee bar. And most unfortunately, Mike is an incredibly tough dude who rotated very quickly. And I ended up in a position where I just couldn't put enough pressure on to break his leg. Um, Sadly. I mean, good for him. It was good. No, it was it was one of those situations. He took some pressure off of We kind of made eye contact as one of those where it was just like, I'm not tapping. And I'm like, okay, let's see what I got. And it's like, yeah. wasn't enough. Bell goes off. And it's like, well, that was everything I had, man. That was like, yeah. he, he earned that win in the hardest way. Um, but like one of those situations where like I did something rather suboptimal, but because I play that game so much, I have solutions right. and I know that that route is a productive route. I've seen mm-hmm. other people use it. I have used it to affect, but like, you know, there's other stuff that you do where you got to be able to throw it out. Sometimes you got to just be able right. like, if there's a fundamental flaw in it, just get rid of it. Right. And like, it's funny too, because like, that's actually a really good example of like, the sport shaping the development of the technique and then moving away from it rapidly. Mm-hmm. So like Tell has developed that game at least in part because he was turtling to avoid the pass points, mm-hmm. which, you know, like if there were no pass points, he wouldn't probably react that way. Yeah. You know, so, so he's taking those points and turning them only into an advantage. He's getting stuck up there and he develops all this technique to then turn that somewhat disadvantageous position you know he stopped the pass but now he's going to get strangled you know into an advantageous position he's doing it against the highest level guys at the time and then the sports like yeah that 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 thing we were calling a sweep before because he was winning on sweeps from reversals from bottom that's not a sweep anymore so that that whole series of techniques like came in favor as a result of the sport and then the rules changed and now it's out of favor yeah but still functionally useful and, in the right context. And uh, also for like the turtling idea, another thing that helped me with that was uh, uh, BJJ Scout did an outstanding video talking about, again, going conceptual about it, talking about like the idea that like that reaction is just a bit of a different reaction. Also probably because I trained with a bunch of people who wrestled mm-hmm. um, in the sense that like you have answers for that. But if you look more at the people who come straight from like the more traditional Brazilian jiu-jitsu lineages, they're always attempting to regard. Even when they, even if they momentarily turn to turtle, they're always looking to right, turn, regard, turn out, turn back, turn out, turn back, uh, specifically for MMA context where you want to see the punches coming. And that one of the things that really messed them up with Sakuraba is he didn't play that game at all. He constantly turtled and turned away and gave up his back because he had solutions for it. Right. And, and for me, like when I'm, when I'm going down a path that is like less than optimal, I accept the fact that a there's going to be some failure involved. That I'm gonna get I'm gonna get beat up doing that at times, and then b I gotta I have to use my own experience, but also look for successful examples to follow. Because if if I'm gonna make it work, I have to see what they do. And that that knee bar partially came from Javi, but also partially came from uh, uh, Sakuraba uh, knee bar and Carlos Newton. And I right specifically he went for the bottom leg, the bottom hook. He I prevented the I bottom hook. I can't get it in my. I can't. I want to see it. Uh, we'll show it to you. Okay. We'll show it to you. Yeah. But like that, that uh, the bottom hook, uh, where he would stop the bottom hook from coming in, hop over the leg and take the bottom leg. Right. And uh, I had done that a couple times, you know, like in gym rolls and things like that. And then, and then Javi came with a version that I believe you also modified from something Neil showed you. So time wise, um, when I went to Japan, Imanari was doing this in one of their friggin' warm ups. <laughs> Okay, like this is just like how we warm up is this standard drill back escape to knee bar. Yeah, and then Neil showed it at his seminar new melanson and had a very similar like, like overall near identical techniques very slightly different contexts, ever so slightly different grips and whatnot but basically the same technique i'm like okay this is two really good guys doing this yeah this is this has got to be investigated more mm-hmm. like this is clearly not just a warm-up drill right. <laughs> you know right, right, right. Um, so so yeah so so i showed it and and you know, it, it, it's always funny to me, like, you know, I'll show something and like, and I'll, I'll, I'll point it out. Like, I'm like, this is my game. This over here that I'm showing you right now, not my game. 
probably valuable might work better for some of you than it works even for me, you know, like triangle chokes. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was like, you took a shine to it immediately. And I'm still working out details of it specifically right. in the gi, figuring out right, like the grips have to dealing with grips yeah, and things yeah, like I, that. And it has to, to be, be clear. It was a no gi context. And you yeah. pulled that off. You, you pulled that off though in your gi I match do primarily in gi right now, but right. it's, I'm still working out the details on the grip fight. Right. Um, because it, it's very opportunistic in the gi and I'm still trying to figure out how to like make it a little more reliably creatable, but it's also not like the first thing I'm looking for when someone's going to my back necessarily, or it's, uh, it's literally the thing I'm looking for while they're taking my back. Once they're on my back, I throw it out and I start right, working. Now it's, like, now it's time to work. More now it's time to work. Escapes. And, and then, and then if I start escaping their back and they start looking to retake, then it comes back into play. Right. So that, that's kind of like how I look at it. But th that's one of those things that came out of like, I have a suboptimal reaction, but it's one of those things where it's like, I, there is a path here to make this viable right. versus me offering arm bars to get out of mount. <laughs> no, nah, there's a fundamental flaw right. with that. And they usually like you right. said, just how, how good is your arm bar escape give, versus how bad is their arm bar? Right. Given, <laughs> given the, like the belt nature of jujitsu and the way they do that in lower ranks, you're actually, if, if you're just rolling with white and blue belts and you're a white and blue belt, you may develop some of those things. And then right usually around purple belt, I feel like you, you've gotten a pretty good sense of like when I shouldn't do that. And that's just, it's one of the downsides of the sorting people by belt rank. Like there's right. upsides to it. There's also downsides. And you know, if I only see my competition in the room as the other white belts, because everyone else is supposed to smash me and I find stuff that works against them. It's probably if, unless I'm unless I'm very coachable and I'm listening to my coaches, it might not be stuff that works well. And I'm right. I know lots of people who have said that even in comp even competitors had to reinvent their game at purple belt, and then they had to reinvent their game again at black belt. And part of it was they were only doing stuff that worked on blue belts, and then when they got right. to purple belt, it didn't work anymore. Oh wow, yeah, that, that's for sure. Like that's that's why I think it's so important, like to to roll with guys of all different body types, all different athletic ability, all different mm -hmm. belt rank. Yeah, you know, like uh, there, I, I find it very weird. Me personally, I, I, I come from the school of thought where it's like I make myself available to anyone and it's kind of like first come, first serve. It's mm -hmm. very rare that I call someone out for a role who's like a lower belt unless yeah. I'm like, hey, I saw something I didn't like. We need to work on something or something like that. Um, but I've, I've, I've been to schools recently where it's like the lower belts aren't allowed to – aren't allowed to ask for roles with higher belts. And I feel like – I'm like, oh, man, that sucks. Like I, I get sort of like the – I get some of the reason for that. Like, like if, especially if you're a super competitive school, like maybe that black belt who's training for a competition soon doesn't really need to waste a round of work on this like day three white belt, yeah. you know, something like that. Right. So, so I get that. But, um, yeah, unless I'm, unless I'm very focused on something in particular, like, and I need to work with like this partner or on this thing, yeah. I always like to like to be approached by the lower belts. Like I, yeah. I want them to come to me. And, and no, that was, I know, I know, but you know, at Mineco's, Mineco doesn't allow lower belts to call out higher belts. Yeah. And so depending on the practice at Alliance, that's, that's, that is the practice right. also. But like, I'm also, I'm, I'm just like, I'm, I'm just waving people over like, all right, whoever wants to yeah, come give me a body. Like yeah, I'm yeah. one of those things. Like if you're a lower belt, open invitation over here, whoever wants to roll, let's come roll. Right. Cause I work on different things when I'm working with different people. Yeah. Like, and it's not just belts. So like, you know, like I, I have some fantastic blue belts that like, yeah. I have to work very specific game on and I, I want that opportunity. Like they're really good at this point or, or this position yeah, or something. Yeah. But you gotta, I mean, what, the way I look at it, me personally, I look at it like, you know, I know how I'm, I have enough experience to know what I want to do in a role. I know my goals. I know what I'm working on as it, as it, whatever, as a, in, you know, yeah. a purple belt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The white belt has no fucking clue on what the fuck he's doing. Pretty much, he's pretty much kind of like flying by the seat of his pants. Sure. I'm just gonna try this, try that. I'm gonna try whatever. And it, me being the higher belt, if I don't want to deal with that, because I'm I, in my head, I'm like, listen, I'm just gonna be working with all larger guys or smaller guys. I'm just gonna be working guard. I'm gonna be working people who are gonna try to smash me. I kind of want to pick that. I don't want some guy who's gonna, hey, dude, it goes roll. Uh, all right, all right. You know, I, I already have a game plan in my head of what I want to get work on that day. Whereas the white belt, they don't really know what's going on yet. They haven't really figured it out. So I can understand why lower belt, it could become a little bit. But, but what if my game plan for that day is I want to work on what assassinating, people, assassinating people. people. <laughs> just, just viciously <laughs> murdering <laughs> white belts. I mean, be. no, is, but, uh, but one of those things too is like when I, gra when I grab white belts, um, uh, I will usually have a specific thing I'm working on. And exactly. If, and if, and, and I usually have a, if I'm on top or if I'm on bottom, because like I may not, 
if we start the roll and they're like aggressively coming at me and we're starting on the knees, I'm not going to knee wrestle them. I will just go to my guard and sweep them and try to hit a very particular sweep. And if I'm getting ready for a competition and I'm rolling with white belt, then I give myself like a, I need to get, I, like, I need to get out of deep trouble before I can actually roll with them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes deep trouble may be a bad position. Sometimes it may be on, I'm going to be in a full on bow and arrow choke. I have to escape before I can start rolling. And I've tapped two white belts as a brown belt because of that. Right. But it made my bone arrow choke escape better, which one of those things, especially if I know like there's a white belt with a good back choke or something like that, you better believe I'm going in. I'm like slapping hands. I'm letting him onto my back <laughs> turn on the side, I'm, yeah. and I'm not allowed to turn it up until he has his choke grip. Right. And then we go yeah. um, sort of thing. So it's just one of those, you have to like, you make the role useful for both of you. Right. Um, and for right. me, like when I'm rolling with a white belt or a, like a fresh blue belt, I often will be like, all right, before I can like turn up the volume on them, I got to get out of a bad spot. I got to let them into a bad spot and then I got to get out yeah. and I got to get out clean. I got to get, I can't, it can't be because they messed up. Yeah. I have to get out with like a clean technique that I initiate that I do that I'm that way. I'm, I'm working on something also, yeah. but again, like that, and I feel like that whole thing, like, again, I, I keep the previous athletic experience really helps because like coming out of coming out of doing fencing, like I have mindsets for training when you don't have skill levels assigned to you when you're just going with right. anybody. I don't remember if it was on here that Riley said it or a different podcast, Riley Bodycomb talking about doing Sambo tournaments and just like. He's, you know, he, he talks about that being a, a, a real feature of Sambo. Yeah, and I, that's that's it's I, I would I would probably say it's likely the same in wrestling. I know it's the mm-hmm. same in fencing where it's just like you don't get a skill level. You go to a tournament, your first ever match may be against an Olympian. Like your your first tournament is not one of those in fencing where it's like, I'm going to a tournament. People are like, wow, you're going to win. They're like, you're not going to win. You may win a match if you get another beginner in your first, like in your pool bout to like right. determine the seating like for how, the tournament. How lucky were you? The, the other terrible guy showed up yeah, that day. Right. Yeah, there, there, there was, and like, yeah, you you usually could assess very, so they would do, um, fencing tournaments do a pool match where you do a short five point match and they give you with like five other people. Everyone fences each other and then based on how many matches you win and how many points you score versus how many points are scored against you they seed a tournament and then you fence the tournament and there's always the joke that once you get to the pool you can tell right away who's losing all their matches and if you can't find that person it's it's you you. (laughs) yeah and like yeah and it's one of those where it's like my first i was lucky enough that i had another beginner in my tournament i got i came away from my first tournament i won a single match out of like seven matches thank thank that fellow noob i know it's like oh i'm so glad i have another first timer in here that i can win five four against right Ooh, that's Yeah, tight one. yeah, and then, um, but that idea too is that like it depends on the tournament you go to, and I also figure you figure that out too that like there are tournaments where just like the good people just don't go to them because it's not worth their time, right. and you can get away with crap winning those tournaments, and even then you get good regionally, you get good at winning regional tournaments. And then you start going to domestic level tournaments and the stuff you win at regional tournaments with doesn't work there. Um, And that also gets into the subjective nature of the thing that makes it, the thing that makes it hard is actually like the high level game, which similar to jujitsu, like there's a high level game and then there's like a club level game and the high level game is almost a completely different world. Right. Uh, Judo works the exact same way. The problem in fencing can be is that it is a highly subjective scoring system dependent on the skill of the ref to see what's happening. And there are times where if you're at a low level tournament, the ref is not good enough to see the distinctions they're calling at the high levels. Mm -hmm. And so you have to almost like revert your game. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that was something that when when That's I'm, interesting. okay yeah it, it, I, don't, I really don't know, don't know a lot about I've seen fencing mm-hmm. I don't really know all the particulars and I, thing, I mean I did fencing and I don't know all the particulars it's so <laughs> oh, okay so well, you, one thing I want to know though is is do you stand on a platform a certain amount width or do you have like a ring so the the fencing uh, piece or strip is fourteen meters long uh, and then it is uh, anywhere between one point five to two meters wide. Can you so break that down in the inches and feet, please? Uh, it's no. about it's about fifteen yards long, okay. and then it is approximately four feet wide. Okay, so you Tom have Grant. to be a, you Tom have Grant, to be so accommodating. Thank you. 
You have to be inside this area. You have to, so if, if you go you off, can move back and forth. If you go off the side of the area, if mm-hmm. you go off one of the sides right. intentionally, you will receive a, especially if, if something's happening, like if you, if you have passed by your opponent and they're going to reset you, you can go off the side and they don't really care. If you are like about to be hit and jump off the side of the arena, you receive a warning. Mm-hmm. And then after that, every time you do it is a point against you. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're intentionally avoiding, if you are forced off the back of the match, you are instantly penalized with a point. There's no, there's no penalty. The other person just earns a point. Pushing your opponent off the back of the 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 strip is a viable way to score. And Did you it, guys start on either either side. You start. And you, walk you start towards each other. Uh, I'm forgetting the official start distance, but you start a set distance from each other, mm-hmm. which uh, I I always knew because Saber was a highly aggressive in which both athletes come forward. If we both were to go forward, it's about two steps in a lunge. Um, so the, the, you're always starting in the same spot, all that stuff, but the, the subtleties of how they call certain, there's three events, there's foil, epe, and saber foil and saber have a very specific rule set that is a case study in like rulemaking to encourage behavior, but people didn't understand how the rules would affect behavior. And it is just run fucking amok. (laughs) <laughs> um, cause I, I generally understand like looking at the rules, you can kind of see what, what they, they were, were going for, what they were going yeah. for, uh, in the sense that they did not want like this to be, uh, not to, but have you ever seen, uh, like com- some forms of competitive stick fighting where both oh, just wave shit ba- as fast both as possible athletes are just whacking each other on the head as fast as they can. Yeah, I've yeah. never seen that. No. Oh, we calf. What's that? That's, well, that's one of the organizations we, we that gotta, has that, we'll, that we'll, reputation. We'll YouTube. It, okay. It's hysterical because it's like, I don't know how all the scoring works, but it looks like if you just hit the guy on the head, you get a point. And both athletes' strategy is if I tap him on the head faster than he taps me, I'm going to – if right. I tap him I, quicker. I will, I will accumulate the what? most points and it possible. Is it's essentially real? both athletes <laughs> not caring they're getting hit just wailing on each other and it looks ridiculous. Right. So they're trying yeah. to, they're trying to disincentivize that kind of behavior and make it more of back and forth, but it has become so what, specific. What's the, I'm sorry, but yeah. what's the specifics of like, why'd you have to stay within this strip? Uh, is fen- fencing is not, is it considered sword fighting? So, <laughs> well, so it is. So the, the historic term fencing, like it, depending on what era you're in mm-hmm. could refer to any sort of fighting with a weapon with some sort of reach longer than like a dagger. It could include swords, axes, spears. Like if you were in the high middle ages and going to a fencing school to get a certificate to become a mercenary, you were learning how to fight with everything. You were like fighting with a pike, fighting with a great sword. It has narrowed down to specific and narrowed down to specifically fighting with swords and the tradition of fencing that we have grew specifically out of um, dueling uh, that slowly turned more into a sport as dueling got made illegal and killing killing people was, was frowned upon suddenly. It was suddenly much more <laughs> much more frowned upon. Yeah, but why do you have to stay within four feet within this like 15-yard uh, strip? Why can't would, you just be in an arena and just, you know, depending Depending on... Like, like, I'm not like sure. Like in The Princess Bride. I, there, oh, there are... There you st- go. There are... Um, this is so my own back, my own background as both studying history and being into martial arts, specifically mm-hmm. starting with fencing. There is a movement going on right now of recreating historical fencing more accurately mm-hmm. that I have not participated in, but I'm deeply interested in and I follow just because it's really, really interesting. Right. And, and this for, is an outgrowth of the general HEMA movement, anyhow, yeah, which yeah. is historic HEMA, historical European HEMA. martial arts. Yeah. You'll, you can fall down a YouTube hole watching long sword very, matches because it's deep it, it is a really fun thing to watch. Are they using actual swords? I mean, no, because you can once. only lose once uh, with actual <laughs> swords. Uh, you can only get hit once. Uh, but I, they have that. I haven't yet to see that television show with the knights. Nobody fighting. uses real swords. Nope. They, 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 they'll, All those they'll are have real the either? Same, they have the real dimensions of a sword, but they, they, they'll have a blunted edge so that you don't have they're a risk of They're using something akin in- to what they would have trained with right, when right. you they're, were learning to sword trainers. fight for real. Because if, if you were practicing with an edged weapon, you can only get hit once, right. essentially. Have you well. seen that television show? 
Uh, which one are we talking about? Knights. What I know what you're talking about, but I don't Knight remember something? what the name is. We were talking about it on another podcast. We did, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I also, I, this, I've got this, this yeah, also gets into uh, like that whole that whole world is going through a very similar jujitsu we like debate about what are the rules of competition and what because there's like some competitions which are really fun to watch, like Battle of Nations, but the way they made it fun to watch is they removed all the stuff that actually works against armor, because to beat someone in armor, you have to fuck them up. Right. like really hurt them mm-hmm. and they don't want there's that no to way to point there's no way to point score that there's safely. no way to point yeah. score that so yeah. they just make all the stuff that actually works illegal and what you end up is people just bashing each other in the head with shields and like punching each other in armor yeah. um yes yeah, because good. because the actual things that would work would like really hurt somebody uh do you think do you think in the future we'll have like an ai and i and knew he was gonna say that i would be able just to beat the it. shit out of that thing and God, see I if hope it actually so. works because yeah, because i would like to be able to practice you know I mean? like breaking arms it, and shit on hysterical. something that, yeah. it would be hysterical if we like went so far like we're we're so far into our perceived future of like having ai and stuff like that and what we want to do with it is recreate medieval stuff right <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, sure what do we want to do with this amazing listen, technology listen. we want to learn how a long sword fight this completely impractical skill in our current world <laughs> exactly we, see okay uh, uh, i mean they, they can make ai fucking tigers and shit why does like it have that? to be ai though why? like i would be perfectly mm-hmm. happy with some sort of like near perfect simulation where you don't actually fucking get hurt like they, like they tried, imagine, they tried wait, something like that. that. I've like seen something where you're wearing like a reality? big suit of sensors and yeah, yeah, hit, stuff like, like that. And I, I that's, it, that's it didn't sketch. really work out. It didn't really work. No, but. no. Like, like how cool would it be? At, okay. You, you can't do this with current technology. Obviously. I don't know if we'll ever get to this point, but like, you know how I can go home and fire up the computer or the PlayStation or whatever. And, fight a dude on street fighter yeah. or, or UFC or whatever. Right. Who's like in another fucking country. Mm-hmm. Imagine the next step of that. Several itinerations, okay, mm-hmm. where where it's like okay, l- currently loading a dude into an arena, and you get to have like an MMA fight from your couch in like virtual reality. Yeah, Black <laughs> Mirror did an episode of something like huh. that. Damn it, I need to watch that show. <laughs> uh, it, it was a little twist, though. Of course yeah. there is because yeah, Black Mirror, it's Black but, Mirror but, but no, no, like it's like something <laughs> like that where you could do all the dangerous shit, and and you know, assuming the simulation is correct. Um, you know, find out what really fucking works when you are yeah. allowed to stab somebody but, or I mean, shoot I would like somebody. To see or, is like a laser tag situation where you go to a fucking arena and you've got these fucking robots and you go in there and fucking. You want walk. a laser tag? Yeah. Some AI? Some fucking yeah. AI. Well, you could do hand wait, 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 weapons, why do you want, all that. Why do, you, why do you want robots instead of actual people? Like, so because you're saying you can't you're, kill you're people. saying you're like. Well, you want, said he laser wants, tag. He wants some well, Westworld stuff. I want some he wants. Exactly. Do you want, a, I you want, want actual guns West versus World robots? Shit. He wants. Yeah, yeah. He wants to be able to go places that, where do the robots where, get guns. Where, sure, why not? But yeah. Well, that sounds you. like we're it's still going to get people dead. Yeah, no, he wants exactly. to be able to go somewhere where the simulation can, there, where he can put his morals in a little box because it's okay to do it to robots. Okay, do it to robots. Oh, okay, for sure. Anyway, as opposed to previous generations, I'm not sure about the exact evolution of the fencing space, but I I would. Depending on the era that you're looking at, movement in duels was higher or lower depending on things like clothing and things mm-hmm. like that, like depending on which era. Like I know I know there was an era for especially when you start talking about small sword, which is the sword the foils based off of, which mm-hmm. was a essentially mostly a a showpiece that you would wear um when you were really rich and that like it was very fashionable at the time for men to wear very high shoes, especially high heeled shoes and moving in those was really quite difficult. So they didn't move very much when they sword fought. You stood there and died like a fucking man (laughs) in high heels. At least you trip Uh, uh, and die on the ground like a dog. Exactly. Um, and, and that the rules of fencing have gone through iterations, uh, but they've mostly stabilized. And now the, the biggest change shakeup happened while I was fencing, where they changed the electric box that measured how... The, so when you hit someone, it is set up so a light goes on. There's, a, there's okay. an electrical system so that if I hit you, I, may, I would get the red light. If you hit me, a green light goes on so that we know if we got hit. It got rid of the need for five judges a match who right. would need to call out contact and all the shadiness. So you wore this gear. You wear, was- so in modern fencing, you wear a gear. And one of the things is uh, there's a lockout timer where if I hit you, my light goes on, and there's a timer in there of how long you can hit me back to potentially have a chance to score depending on the, the situation that followed. If only one light goes on, only one at, one athlete scores. That's just the end of it. Got it. Um, 
generally referred to as a one light touch or a one light. Like mm-hmm. there's no arguing a one light. I hit you, you didn't hit me. When I was fencing, they changed the lockout time and made it like a fraction of what it used to be. And it completely changed the game. It can put like, I happily had not been fencing at a super high level while I was in high school. And, but I know people where it trashed their game. They had to like almost relearn how to do things or quit. Yeah. Or quit because it, it opened up certain things that were considered to be not optimal technique. Um, and like going against the actual rules of fencing because you could get away with it because you hit them and there was enough time span they couldn't hit you back to get a light on where previously they could. So that's like the most recent change. And that was like in 2004. Mm-hmm. Other than that, the rules have stayed, the rules stay very stable. Are there um, fencing tournaments and like places people go to all the time? I mean, yeah, there's the I, Olympics and then there's. <laughs> uh, that's right. They have fencing. He, he wants is, to know what yeah, the IBJJF no is for. It's for, the Olympics. The, for, the, that's the it. fencing. So there's the, the International Fetting, F- Fencing Federation, which is the FIE. Um, it is primarily based in French. The official refereeing language of fencing, fencing is French. Yeah. Um because you have to have an official refereeing language, the official refereeing language of of judo is Japanese, Japanese. you know, so that if you go to an international tournament, there's only one language being spoken by the referees so that you're not like, I don't know that command. You're speaking German. Yeah. For all you guys that are always like, I hope jujitsu gets in the Olympics. I hope you realize that probably means you need to know more Portuguese. Yeah. You, you will (laughs) learn, you will learn more Portuguese just because you'll have to know the referees commands. Skateboarding is going to be in the Olympics. Yeah. That better be in English. Yeah. That would be so, um, so, and then, and then each country has its own like section of like there's usa fencing which is the official olymp like uh olympic committee recognized organization in the u.s and they put on tons and tons of tournaments um actually for an article i did like a while ago talking about uh like it was specifically looking at why aren't there more jujitsu fighters succeeding in mma and it was it was going through the whole idea of like the lack of inf- infrastructure in jujitsu compared to like wrestling. Like if you are a if you are a wrestler, you get to wrestle in high school. It is the the costs of it are mostly taken care of by the high school. Yeah, you get to do a strength and conditioning program as part of that. Like all of that is taken care of. It is entirely geared toward competition. And then when you finish with high school, like the top zero point zero five percent make it into a D one room. And then those guys get access to an even higher level of training and higher level of competition. Right, and right. then, you know, only eight of them a year get to be in each weight class, get to be all Americans. And then, you know, so you're distilling talent down in that. Whereas in jujitsu, it's like, well, we, we go to the gym and we right. like, work out. Right, and right. then if you and have then, some money for a gym membership, you like lift on the side. Right. Um, and, and if you have the balls, you might compete if you both have the desire and the money, and you happen to start when you were seventeen, right? And that, you're that's like, a definite benefit. And you're a black belt when you're twenty three, and you're not getting a black belt when you're thirty six. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's so different. Um, and, but in one of the comparisons I made is also the jujitsu community is just small. It is oh, just, yeah, it yeah. is just a small community, which and, is evidenced by the fact that people can like be like, you seem to know everyone, and I'm like, well, like it kind of do. And <laughs> again, this, this is from several years ago. This is like 2015, 2014. But the IBJJF Pans like had set the record for the largest jujitsu competition ever, and it was something like somewhere between five and six thousand competitors. Right, um, and it was like that's really cool, but I'm like, but compare it to the USA National Fencing Championships. Not even like this is not a world event. This is USA only qualification. You have to go to a regional tournament and place well enough to be able to, to be on go the world to this, team to, no to go to the national championships oh, oh, I'm, I'm you don't sorry. get to just sign up you have to go right place you have to earn your spot a, to the you have to earn a spot yeah and it was a it was like the same size right just it was, to make it was the like, it was about six six to seven thousand fencers and it's like that's the benefits of being an olympic sport like you're huge compared to jiu-jitsu is a very small community right. um, so when jiu-jitsu gets in the olympics it's gonna blow the fuck up is that what you're saying Possibly. I, I would also say my time in fencing has given me a firm warning on why you don't, don't want to be an Olympic yeah. sport. Because mm-hmm. man, does it it fencing is so far divorced from its actual roots as really? sort of, and yeah. is entirely to it's right. entirely to satisfy. Same the transformation Olympics. with judo, same yep. transformation with taekwondo. And cur- yeah, mm-hmm. and it, it is it it you you sacrifice a lot. Well, didn't you, they say it 2024 or something like that? Or 2020? For what? What for, ju- for jujitsu? We I don't, don't think even, that's a Official, do we don't even have a, a recognized 
bo- uh, organization body. Yeah. Like the, right? I, the, I, th- I think that is just the, there's a big movement to try and get it in the Olympics and we're not going to make 2020, obviously. Yeah. Uh, no. it, it, step one is you need an air national organizing body that is capable of being recognized as an Olympic air, uh, organizing body. And the IBJJF cannot be that because it is a for-profit company. Right. right. You have to be not for profit. So like the IBJJF cannot be the Olympic organizer for the so Javier has got to come up with his own. I ain't doing it. Man. Well, That's you, a lot of paperwork. Then, yeah. And then, and then you got to establish yourself <laughs> as big enough. And then on top of that, someone other than Brazilians need to win it. Like we have yeah. Americans doing well in it. But again, if you go back through the IBJJF world championships, like, well, it, it's not just win it. No. Right. It, it's, it's, because, it's that you have to have adequate representation in, in a large enough number of countries, yes. which I think, I, I think, think we're at that point there. now, but man, how many gyms would you blow up if you, if we became an Olympic sport and suddenly it's like, awesome. Two athletes from Brazil can go. Right. Like how many gyms just explode at that point when they all have to like split up because like, I don't want to train with this guy's in my weight class. Like, right. You know, like it, it would take all of those problems and bump either, either bump them up to the next level or become like fencing. And it's just like, whatever. Right. Like, yeah. Cause I mean, you're, you're not going to have like, it, okay. Spitball in here, mm-hmm. assuming jujitsu transfers over to the Olympics. I assume we're not going to have multiple belt ranks. It's only going to be black belt level. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Every country can send an athlete for each weight, weight class. class. Maybe two. Maybe two. Maybe a max of two. Like, how does judo do it? They do a max of two in each weight class. Oh man, I'd have to double check. Yeah, but like, yeah. yeah. So you got severe limitations. It would open up the it would open up the competition that the the brackets would not be full of Brazilians, right? Because um, they would have to whittle down themselves. Brazilian the the, well, Nat, the Brazil the Brazil Olympic trials would be fire. They would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the it, it would be it, again. It would change the dynamics of jujitsu gyms pretty pretty drastically, um, more so than even now. But right. like, yeah, that. But yeah, you you'd have to have some kind of national qualifier for yep. each each region, or not. Sorry, not even each region. Each uh, participating country, and you'd need an international level competition right. structure with that particular organization. Probably tracking like world points and stuff like that. It's it's a different structure than we have right now. Yeah, yeah. IBJJF is doing some of those things, but they as struct as they're structured now, they can't be an organizing body, right? And so and there's like another big problem. And again, this is a problem with other Olympic sports as well. Like mm-hmm. like you know, if you've got excessive travel to get to the big points tournaments, like this happens in judo, where there's a lot of guys that are super talented that can't actually make the rounds without massive sponsorship or begging for donations, you know? So like that becomes a big issue when you need to develop qualifying points yeah. to get onto the team. Fencing's the same way. Yeah. Um, I was not, I was not good enough. I was, I was like getting pretty good at a domestic level, but I was still not great. Um, but I couldn't travel to the domestic tournaments. I had a teammate who was amazing. Uh, he was originally born in Georgia, the country, and moved to the U.S. And he was incredible. And um, he just had no money and couldn't. The first international tournament he ever went to, or not the first one, but ever went to, but like the first one he did in like like a five year span was the Olympic trials for London, and he came within like a point of making the Olympics. Um, but it was one of those things. It was it. And that it was, we were in a, we were, he's in a room with like people who can travel all the time, either because they have an association backing them that will send them to those places or the families were independently wealthy enough to send them there. And he, he's just kind of sitting there being like, I, I, I'm either right there with these people in the room or I am beating them. When we go to NCAA competition, I'm crushing people who are like going to the Olympics Right, but I, I can't right. travel enough to accumulate to earn that, the points to and, earn the and, points to yeah. go to the, to go to the Olympics. That fucking sucks. Yeah, uh, I just, not to change the subject too much. I just want to talk a little bit about some UFC stuff. Sure, sure. Right. The, the most recent UFC stuff. Yeah, the most. Oh, recent you stuff. you may be <laughs> yeah, might might be disappointed. Why? What? I didn't get to watch the UFC yet. Man. I, I also have not been able to watch what it. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> I was at a seminar yesterday all day. I was out with Gio. Oh wait, maybe well, I, I didn't. also didn't get on the podcast. Yeah. Just, Gio, just, Gio. I'm just, I, just I, I to navigate, down those rankings. Just navigate just my failures on a week by week basis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I it's fine. No I, I've I've run into the I've run into the I've run into a multi problems. I've stopped writing, so I'm no longer required to watch 
uh, UFC every card. event. Uh, I also hit a point where I was just I was watching thousands of fights a year, mm-hmm. including regional cards and things like that. Oh wow! That I I just I was not super interested in. Also the the in cage action is still quite good. Every antics. Everything else about the sport right now frustrates me or pisses me off. Just yeah. like b- between the antics, the way things are being handled, like I, I feel, I feel scuzzy almost supporting the sport in a lot of ways because I, I just like feel like the athletes are so thoroughly being screwed over in most cases. Ever since the Reebok deal, yeah, it's just yeah. it's really tough to like feel like I enjoy the sport and I like the fighters, and I feel like the worst thing to do for them is to pay the company employing them in some ways. Yeah, it's a tricky situation. Um, the because it's still you know it's still the prestigious organization to be in it still and holds the, that number one spot they've dropped the frequency of cards which which was a huge like i think i was actually forced to cover them in the highest frequency of cards where there was a right. card like literally every weekend and in some cases we're still every weekend basically yeah, but like, we get like a weekend off occasionally there yeah. were there were I, just, I remember weekends where we had like up to three ufc cards in a week Mm-hmm. Um, depending on what was happening because they're trying to get fight pass going. They were trying to like drown the other competition in cards. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, it's just, it, it, it got harder and harder to justify the like six to seven hour time span a card takes up. Like for for even even enjoying the sport, it got harder and harder to justify that, especially as like now yeah. I have a kid and it's just like, you know, MMA I have, could, I have two MMA hours could use myself. an off season. Yeah, I have two hours to myself right. and I feel like I've got something special, you know? <laughs> I know how it feels. Trust yeah. me. I mean, Khabib, I mean, you guys know what happened, obviously. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. But the call out of George St. Pierre. Yep, I'm fully aware. That's, that's, a, that's, I, that's probably, I would want to see that. You want, that. so here's the here's question. Do you want to see Khabib GSP more than you want to see Khabib Ferguson? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Khabib GSP, man. GSP's that's the fucking, one. He's the the greatest, right? Basically, yeah. I yeah. mean, and we're just going to keep bringing him back until time defeats him. Right. Right. You until. Know. It, and, until Khabib Smish. Until until he's <laughs> yeah, it, but man, that's gonna be the, the, it, that's, that's an interesting skill matchup. It is also telling to me just like having been away from MMA for a while, and then also from the fact that like I was covering it for a while, that most people their primary interest, with the exception of a couple names, mm-hmm. the most interest gets drawn by fighters who were big when I first started watching MMA. Yeah, it's crazy. Like George St. Haven't... Pierre is still the one that people want to see. Where it's like, but we've he's been retired and not fighting consistently for so long, but we've not been able to. We haven't made the next superstar. We haven't made the next super. And I think that's well, also we, we, we kind of did, but we kind of did. But we've also they've changed. They changed. They turned sh- out to be an asshole. <laughs> Which one are you referring to? You can't just leave it dangling like that. I mean, which the, superstar would that be? I, I mean, turns out, turns out a lot of them. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's why I said it. That uh, way. Yeah. No, the the but they changed the, they changed the structure of the sport to make superstars, and then failed to produce. And it's actually producing fewer people. It's producing fewer fighters that people care about. Right. Um, which is just it's a weird dynamic, and uh, but yeah, it, it it does. I mean. We've shifted. It. I mean, like I, I know a lot of people in the writing world still who jokingly refer to what we're in in as the attitude era of MMA. <laughs> that like that's the feel of it right, right now, and that it is distinctly shifted from the George St. Pierre era, where like St. Pierre was wearing suits and had a PR agency and was making canned statements, and it was about what you did in the cage, and it wasn't so much even how you did it; it's who you beat. Right. And like the, like the runs you went on and stuff like that, people were comparing the like relative careers of Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre of like the quality of their weight class and all this and how many times they defend their title. And it was felt much more like a sport yeah. than it does now. Right. right. Where it's a lot more spectacle now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it is kind of like a, I mean, Khabib is huge. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know that, He's definitely huge overseas. Uh, Khabib is one of the like, one of the breakthroughs. Right, um, right. So, so he's made it in a way. He's made it. Uh, um, I don't. I, I don't know what the limits of his potential stardom are, though. Yeah, like GSP was a. He was the right guy at the right time. Right. In a lot of ways, and like, I mean, you know, he was getting on Wheaties boxes and all, all, <laughs> all like the traditional. Like all, all, all superstar stuff, right? The, the stuff we normally associate with making it as a sports athlete, as a sports athlete, yeah. And and now also there's like, what does it mean to make it in the current era? Where like, 
you know. Because, like, I think the whole situation with, like, Mast of it all, mm-hmm. this massive resurgence in popularity, mm-hmm. that's pretty fascinating to look at in yeah. and of itself. Um, Diaz coming back and, and, like, people going crazy for it, like, that's also, like, an indication that, well, one, they probably never gave him the shot that they should have. Yeah. Like, let, let's be real honest there. But, yeah, like, the fact that he's got so much time off and then comes back and is basically, like, like one of their top draws – that's that's a bad sign, yeah. you know, for the organization, not for him, obviously. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm feeling you what you're saying there. It and it, it's an interesting thing, and there are fighters that, that like I said, the, the actual quality of the fights in the cage are still really high, mm-hmm. um, and the quality of fighters has only gone up. Like I, when I do find for time, sure when I do find time to sit down and watch an MMA match, you, know, you see the evolution still happening. The the quality of product is still there, and it's everything around it that's changed. Right. That that's why I tend to no longer watch the events live because mm-hmm. so I can cut through the bullshit. Yeah. I mm-hmm. don't I don't watch any of the well not any I, I watch relatively little of the the UFC's hype. And in some ways, it's also, it's come full circle. Like, we're back to the Ken Shamrock era of MMA. Ken and Tito. Yeah, like, where where it is this, is this, like, to a certain, like, to a very large extent, they're just playing characters. And and sometimes, sometimes the real person gets lost in the character. Yeah. Um, Well, well, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm afraid that it's going to go to where... The belt doesn't really matter. It's like the person holding the I belt. I feel like we're already there. Uh, yeah, it's too late. Doesn't matter like, anymore. I, I feel like that line got crossed with McGregor just n- winning belts and then never defending them. Right. And right. moving on to the next big Payday. fight. The next big fight that was just a big fight. Not right. and and then it got to the point where you know they were throwing interim belt matches on everything. Yeah, they felt too many like interims. they needed a title fight on every belt to make it sellable because mm-hmm. they were running so many cards to make the card dis- like to make the card seem worthwhile. They they like, hey, if we have any belt, even an interim belt, it sells better. So put an interim belt on every card. So yeah. you're saying you, you don't approve of the uh, the BMF belt coming up? <laughs> <laughs> I've like. Uh, I've lost track in like how many times they've split belts and things like that. It's ridiculous. And I, I marketing wise, I know why they're doing it. Like we, no, we, I, yeah, I understand the business it, it, side of it, but, but you're again, also devaluing the lineal title. But yeah, and and that was part of it is that a lot of the emphasis, and it was one of those things that in the right when I was writing, a lot of us started seeing these trends. We're like, man, it seems like it seems like they want to sell the UFC. And then to they sold of course, the UFC. To which, of course, anytime anyone in the community posed that question, you know, it would be uh, Dana White, you're a fucking idiot, sort of rant mm-hmm. on you. And then, like, two years later, oh, wow, it turns out they, they sold the UFC and they've been, they've been shopping it for, like, five years at this point, <laughs> like, sort of thing. We're like, the signs were all there. And then once they sold it, it seems like now they're just trying to squeeze everything they can out of it before the bubble just thoroughly pops. You think it's going to pop? I think we're we're already on the other like they've they've shifted how it runs, but it's definitely come way down from like the high the heydays of like UFC 100. Like, well, that was a very I mean that, that, was, that, a very, that was a very special card. Well, that, that's be hard it, to reach. It was a special card, but there was it was that upward action of right. like so many new fans coming in and all that. And since then, they've maintained like sustainable good numbers, but it's, it's, I don't know where it all is. You don't now. think it's got much more, more room for growth. You're saying, yeah, or like they, I think, I think in the iteration they had, it hit, it hit its cap and that there may be where the, they, they transitioned to this attitude era. And now that's probably, we'll see what comes next. Like everything comes in waves, everything changes, right? Mm-hmm. You know, cause it, the attitude era grew out of, grew out of Rhonda and McGregor being like singular stars who had like really big personalities who would then turn it up. A little right. bit, yeah. No, when, you, when the lights came on, within a short span of time, you had Ronda Rousey. Well, sorry, Chael Sonnen, mm-hmm. Ronda Rousey. Chael was the one that really Chael, started. Chael started like, that, and but. Chael, Chael, like would get fights he would not have gotten otherwise by having a big mouth by having a big mouth yeah, yeah and and 100%. other fighters saw that and were like man, I'm going to do that too. I want to make some money. I'm going to do it, and it was going against the the straight laced PR statements of GSP. And like, that's what fighters are trying to be. I mean, remember John Jones came into the sport. He was still in that mode when he first came in. Jones was Jones yeah. was v- like his first couple fights. He was very cautious, very um, measured statements to the media. And then once it became clear, it didn't matter. 
Right. He just cut loose and, and we, we've seen how he's been since. Right. Right. But I, remember I wasn't when he, sure who you were talking about before. Well, <laughs> I remember when he first came in, people, the, the initial thing was like, wow, this guy's really good, but he's really like, just kind of a plain, like kind of had this whole, like, <laughs> I remember a time when people would argue about like, actually argue about whether John Jones was actually a wholesome individual or whether it was all just an act. Yeah. 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 And I, I, the way I, he first came in, he, cult, <laughs> he cultivated the wholesome image when he first came in. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it became clear that he didn't have to. Right. Um, right. And, but yeah, that but just then, started that road. But I think in that case, like that's actually like the wholesomeness was a false front. Yeah. And most people, not everyone, most people saw through it yeah. and, mm -hmm. and like rightfully called him out for being oh, fake. Yeah. 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 Right. Whereas, whereas some people are the, I don't want to say the exact opposite where it's like, everyone's like, oh no, behind closed doors, he's a really nice guy. This is just for show. Like Kobe Covington. Yeah. Like Kobe's an example of yeah, that. He where is, he plenty is of people say. He is the most obvious example of playing a character. Right. Like he is. I mean, he, he literally changes his voice. He is. Yeah. He right. even on that uh, food truck diary. Yeah. He broke, yeah. he broke the old, he broke the one rule. Right. He broke character. Yeah. Right. He bro bro man, you don't break kayfabe, man. You never break kayfabe. And that's, that's, <laughs> but we've reached the point where like, like that's, that's what it is in MMA where we've got people who are just like playing characters. And Kobe is the most obvious example of that is that his job is to get the entire arena to hate him. Like right. however he, he does do a pretty it. good job of he it. Did. He's, he's yeah. to be fair. He's pretty good at it, but like, and but yeah, he does come off as like a 12 year old internet troll to me. He does. So. And, and the, the, and then you get the people who are not so good at playing it, but they try anyway. Uh, I'm not saying Dylan Dan is here, but Dylan Dan is, but you're implying strongly Dylan Dan is Everyone I talk to says in person, he's such a fantastic dude, but he plays this like he's terrible at playing a character online and gets everyone to hate him. <laughs> right. But also, but it, it, yeah, it generates hype. At it, he's generating more interest than people who aren't. Listen, D Dylan Dennis, AJ less so now, less so, but for, for a time there, Gordon Ryan, Dylan Dennis and AJ Agazarm were like the most talked about athletes within our community. Yep. Period. And yep. Love him or hate him didn't matter. They were still. I remember they were the most talked about. They got like was on every card that people were streaming just because they needed somebody on there that people would tune in to watch get beat because people <laughs> want to watch AJ lose because he his whole thing right. was I'm just going to piss people off. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's that's kind of like so it is one of those things. It also goes into the whole thing that like as I transitioned out, hate clicks are the only clicks right now. Like in a lot of the content creation. <laughs> Like that's changed a Even little traditional, bit. Even traditional traditional like, news media. But like yeah, but that's it's all about like what gets the most clicks? Hate clicks. So and I remember when I was writing the stuff I made was not getting a lot of attention, but it was mostly like Buddy Elbow employed me because they wanted that like that, that, that like deeper, more technical content. Right. But the money makers at that time were like more on the skip Bayless take of like you had a writer who that people would read their stuff specifically to disagree with them hmm. that like their job was to take a hot take position right. Here's my hot take on and then create so -and -so. an internet debate yeah. and people would either agree with them or disagree with them and we've hit a point now where like we don't need the writer because people will just scour the internet <laughs> to find one tweet that will set people off take a <laughs> screenshot of it put it up make there, a whole article about it and then yeah, you make a whole it. article about yeah. a random tweet yeah and like, Damn, it's fucking crazy. And then, and yeah, yeah and it's like, if you spend any time on social media, you see that. But Gizito does not. Nope. No, I was to say, it is one of those things I've backed away in a lot of cases because it's just like, man, I don't, like, there's so many different things, like, to make money, you're trying to make people angry. And it, mm. it, it circles back to, like, again, those characters where it's like, how many... We have a ton of heels in 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 MMA. That's the thing. Like, uh, how many, where, where are the baby faces? Where are the guys you want to root for? That that's a real problem. Um, I think we've got guys that can potentially build there, but but the reason the whole babyface heel dynamic works so well in pro wrestling is because we're in control of the you results. Can control the wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Right. laughs> like that's the thing. Like nobody really wants the heel to always win, yeah. and unfortunately, like right now, all the guys playing the top heel characters also, for the most part, I mean, like that was we got massive win streaks. <laughs> Yeah, because because um, 
that's that's the one thing that's you can't control it, and you don't have anyone playing the good guy that people like, and the people. Well, Khabib is a good well, guy. I was say, but you get the people who then fall into. Then it's just about who are you a fan of, right? Like uh, there are people who are massive Khabib fans, and there are people who are, are like Khabib's a good fighter, but I'm gonna keep him at distance because of other things going on around him, right? Um, Why? What else is going on around him? Oh God, oh. do we have that much? What time is it? Why? I didn't hear anything. Okay. Uh, it, it also so, has to do with who the UFC is doing business with in in uh, in Dagestan in that area of the world. Uh, inform us, please. I, I'm a, so. Um, do you feel current enough to discuss this? Or? I don't, but I can direct you to the people who are. Okay. Um, uh, Bloody Elbow has a fantastic writer whose name I'm blanking on right now, who has extensively gone into the. Um, the relationship of the dictator in Chechnya and MMA and the money he puts in and the, how he cultivates fighters there. Also, like, running extermination concentration camps in his country and stuff like that. And what? Yeah, so there's that that whole thing. Uh, uh, Kareem at Bloody Elbow has done fantastic work on this. Very detailed. How, like, how, to the point where he act, he legitimately has to be careful because they may be trying to kill him. Right, right. Um, Wait, how does, how does Khabib... Wait, how's he associated with that? How, he came out of that region of the world. You got to do business with that guy to come out of that part of the world in MMA. Is do business with this particular person? I mean, he is the dictator of Chechnya, which is like primarily where most of the MMA in that region is happening. Um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Like, there's there is written there's written material online that you can find about this from very credible sources. Uh, Kareem being one of the one of the primary ones who has reported on this really thoroughly. Um, I'm not. I don't. I don't know if Khabib's like on that is like believes in it or is just like, hey, I got it. Like, I'm from this region of the world. It's what you got to deal that's with. How, yeah, that's how the play game's ball. played. Like, you know, sort of thing. To get out, you got to play the game. Um, but I know people. I know of people. I know people who keep like, hey, Khabib's a great fighter, but I'm not going to like go all in on him because I'm worried about some of the stuff going on around him and stuff like hmm. that. I mean, like, it's just, it, again, man, it's just, there's there's so much going on that like, it's hard, especially if you're coming out of a bad part of the world, man, like, like the, the caucuses, like bad stuff's happening down there and, right. and you got to play ball if you want to get out. Jeez. So yeah, the, the, there, there's that element. I mean, there's, there's other things too, like, like, some people have completely forgiven and forgotten yeah. Khabib going over the fence and jumping in the crowd and causing an absolute Some security people haven't. nightmare. Yeah. And plenty of people have not. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, like I, I like Khabib. I like yeah. him on a technical level. I like most of the stuff that he says, not everything. I, I'm pretty sure if he and I got into a lengthy discussion of politics, religion, and, and things like that, we'd we disagree on more than we agree on. And, and to a certain mm -hmm. extent, like if you're gonna if you're gonna follow anything, you just gotta like set people's work and their beliefs. Like yeah, right, right. I got I there are people I enjoy their work and we right. and we and that's disagree what I, with things. And, and that's the whole thing. Like I have never ever said a, a bad word about McGregor on a technical level mm -hmm. or Colby Covington, like their ability to perform in the ring, you mm -hmm. know, maybe, maybe they're not perfect. Don't get me wrong, but like their ability to perform in the ring is what I'm really, really after. But when your personality becomes such a distraction that I can't comfortably focus on that, that's when I start losing interest. Yeah. And, and to a certain extent, like MMA has always had big personalities, right. like, like we got one of them on the wall right there. The Diaz who, brothers who are guy? like a huge personality, but they're also, it's like a genuine, that's them. Right. That's, no, that's, 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 that's them. Thing, and right? that yeah. makes it immediately, even if you're not, even if you're not like really about that, right like, now what I, they're about, you, you can still respect it because they are being a genuine person right, and exactly. they're also incredibly skilled. Like, I don't, I don't imagine I would like enjoy hanging out with the Diaz brothers, but man, I'd love to learn some, I'd love to learn from them and I respect them and like watching them right, fight. Right, right. You know, Masvidal's the same way. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Masvidal, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, but, that, that is a real dude. Yeah. And then, and, and the, that is, that is, that is notably lacking in a lot of f fields of MMA right now where there's yeah. less, less people being, being generally, there are, there are examples. There are hundred percent, right. but the big, the big level stars like feel like they have to put on this performance now. Right. And, and like actually noteworthy, like, Khabib said, man, right after the fight, I can't remember what part of the interview it was, but somebody asked him and he, I'm going to butcher this slightly, but he was like, you know, to, to have money in your hand is good. Yeah. But to have money in your mind, that's no good. Yeah. You know, and, and he was just taught, you know, because, you know, after Poirier, he gave away his purse to, to chair, to Poirier's charity yeah. and, yeah, you yeah, know, like the whole like, thing. 
Yeah, I think so. He, a and sizable then, chunk, if not the whole thing. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, okay, I, it might have been the the amount that he got, yeah. like his show money. Yeah, like yeah, the, I, the I, one half. Yeah, I, I didn't see what the final number was. Then Dana ended up saying he'd match it. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. so, like just that that attempt. Like that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, and that's that's one of those things that like that's a genuine moment. It feels like right. You God, know? I hope it is. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Anyway, all right, guys, we got to wrap this up. Tom, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at TP underscore Grant. I still will tweet about, uh, grappling stylized violence of all kinds. Other than that, um, personal, personal Instagram account. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I have a Facebook page, uh, that is just TP Grant MMA. That is, I usually am just constantly sharing grappling related things on there. Other than that, I'm, I'm out of the content creation world for the most part. Uh, you can swing by Schaumburg, uh, Schaumburg, uh, Alliance and, roll with me, train with us. Uh, that's always a good thing. Or Deerfield, catch us uh, doing some Sambo Nogi sort of training on uh, Sunday mornings. Cool. All right. We'll see you guys later. Ciao. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. For more information about Grappler Union Podcast, you could visit us at our website at grapplerunion.com. You can follow us on Instagram at Grappler Union. Please like us on Facebook. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And all of our episodes are available on our YouTube channel. Say what? Be sure, be sure to subscribe. Yeah, subscribe to all that shit. <laughs> um, you got to do another take, right? Oh.